Is that better? Can you all hear me okay? Uh, would you all please rise uh, for the invocation and the pledge? <clears throat> Lord, we come to you this morning <clears throat> and we ask for your attendance today at this meeting and I ask you to give the council members wisdom, and integrity, and kindness as we discuss the business at hand today. <clears throat> we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> And I'm now called uh, to order the Tourist Development Council meeting on Tuesday, February 6th. It is 9 o'clock. Um, first order of business is a quorum call. <clears throat> Pam Avera, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Tony Anderson. Here. Pam Avera. Here. Gary Birmeyer. Here. Brian Christensen. Matt Hagan. Here. Mark Hodgkin. Present. Tim Norris. Here. Jim Richard. Here. Richard Veldman. Here. Yes, we do have a quorum. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> uh, if there's any public comments, we can make them at this time. Uh, what I'd like to add to that. <clears throat> If you have to leave early and need to make a, a comment about something that's on the agenda today, feel free to do so at this time. <clears throat> if not, we'd like for you to reserve your public comments at the time that the topic comes up that you'd like to comment on. <clears throat> uh, we need a motion for approval of the minutes of the meeting of December 5, 2017. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion approved. Financial report. Uh, Jason. Good morning, Jason. Uh, good morning, Council. Mr. Chairman. Jason Cutshaw, the Director of Administration. I've got some fun charts and some good information for you. Uh, kicking off our new year with October is the beginning of our first year with our new accounting codes for marketing, communication, and the sales department. As a review, these are separated out to better track spending and available funding as the de these departments are ever moving productively forward. As of October 31st, we are 8% through our spending year, with all categories 6% or below. Some items, such as memberships and large equipment, usually hit within the first quarter. The emerging markets will be closing out as that penny hasn't had funding allotted since 2014. So that's where you'll see the biggest trend. Um, for our uh, October revenue, uh, as far as reserves goes, as of October 31st, um, we are uh, at 40,671,499 in reserves. Our anticipated revenue for FY18 is 23 million. That's rounded down from the actual uh, revenue in FY17. We are at 1,310,296. That is a, that's 5.87% towards our goal. In November, uh, we are 17% through the year with all spending categories at 6% or below. Some items such as contracts and printing will start to come in as we are stocking up for the season. And then for the reserve report, Reserves as of November, we have $41,351,089. Our anticipated revenue again for FY18 is $23 million. We currently have $2,110,045. That's 9.46% towards our goal. And the next slide has got our TDT report, which has got some good news in it. In October, we had a slight dip, and after I talked with the clerk's office, it looks like a main bed tax player. Uh, payer went out of business or sold out and transferred and was delayed in that month of paying. Um, if they would have paid in that month, we would have matched last year and pretty much balanced out. But this is another reason why that local enforcement collection is so good because within a month they figured it out and went and knocked on the door and, 
and we're able to get it. So that's one of the main reasons why you see that increase in November. Um, so in October, we were down 2.41% at 1,350,821. Um, but in November, as you can see, we were up by 25.97% over FY17 at 824,482. Um, for the year to date, we are up by 67 at that point um, as a total so far for $2,175,303. And this just in, at the very end of last week, we got our numbers in for bed tax collection for December. And again, we saw another upward trend at 16.05%. Um, for the year, or to date, year to date, at $651,529. That brings our year to date average up to 8.72%, so it's already higher than the ending average of last year at $2,826,833. So I respectfully request the board to approve the financials as presented. All right, we have a motion to accept the financials as presented. So motioned. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Those, in, those opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> I need to deviate here for just a minute. Um, we have an addition uh, to the agenda that just came up before these were printed. You should have a new one in front of you. And it's a request recommendation to the BCC to advertise a request for qualification for public transportation system in South Walls using the draft RFQ outlined. <clears throat> um, I'm just, uh, I need a motion and a second and a vote to add this to the agenda. So moved. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> We're going to move a couple items on the agenda. Commissioner Anderson has to leave early for a meeting in Tallahassee. So we are going to skip over to uh, 180169, which is the Florida Attorney General Transportation Summary. And I believe that's Mr. Atkinson. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I provided the board a summary of the Attorney General's opinion, and I believe you have a copy, or at least in the past received a copy of the Attorney General's opinion. In essence, we got the answer that we had anticipated we would receive, but providing the specific guidance we needed. Uh, we had always anticipated that we would be able to provide this under the category of a service the question was whether or not it could be public or private in operation. The Attorney General has clarified that that is not the determinative factor. So we can have it as a private operation for which we can contribute funding if we deem that it is a service and take the necessary steps to promote it as a service to tourists. The big takeaway from the opinion, however, in my opinion at least, is that we have to be very cautious that the service is not tailored more towards the citizens of Walton County than to tourists. And while I know one of the big concerns with any transportation authority is how do we move people around, and there's certainly no way that we can ever say that locals would not use the transit system or that locals who work down there may not engage in some kind of park and ride to work, the purpose must be that we must tailor it to tourism promote it to tourism with separate dollars on top of whatever money goes towards operation of such an entity. And hopefully we have enough to justify that it's being used to tourist based activity rather than local econo economic activity. If that's the case, the TDC can fund, a, fund it. The likely outcome I would expect at some point in time is if we start funding this that we would not ever be in a position to fund 100% out of the gate based on the Attorney General's observation, even with a legislative finding saying we could do so by the BCC. My reason for that is I don't know that we'll ever have enough data to support, at least not at the outset, that this is a primary tourist activity versus something else when it, outs when it starts out. 
The difference between shoulder season and peak season is going to make a difference. Where the transit stops are and where the hubs are. You've seen the transportation study, of course. That makes a big difference. Some of these routes are going to be much more geared towards probably local traffic than not. So how it gets built out, what it looks like, I think a partial funding scenario is the most prudent measure from the TDC. Whether the county itself kicks in some money as well could be a question. With us revisiting within certain measurable time frames how much contribution is available. If we can actually document this is a primary tourist activity and we promote this and spend our marketing dollars to promote it as a service to get people here and show them what this does for quality of tourism life, then one day you may well see that number tick up closer to that overall number of higher financing or all the way up to 100% if it were ever to be publicly operated. But I'm here for any questions you have. Tried to summarize the Attorney General's opinion. They gave us some comparative examples. Frankly, nowhere else has really taken on a project that looks the same degree we've looked at. So that's one reason why I think some of the prior opinions are just really guidance more than they are direct on point examples. I got a question. Um, Clay, you know, there's a, a bill in the House and Senate that's uh, now uh, on the Senate uh, Finance and Tax Subcommittee and it's gone through. So it looks like and it has transportation in there. So will that enhance what we have as far as this opinion goes or, or would it make it more, I guess, more open? My thought is that should that bill pass as it's presently worded, and that's always a huge if with the legislatures, I think we all know, it would possibly provide even more ability to fund, but what it would really do is create a second avenue for funding in the sense that we knew we could not fund this under the general TDT elements of revenue expenditure, so we had to look at it, does it fit under the ambit of an event, activity, venue, or service, which primary purpose is the promotion of tourism. You can demonstrate that by marketing that, in this case, service to tourists. And as long as we market it, we can do it. So my understanding of that bill, if we were to pass as worded, would mean that the ability to do this would likely not be as tied to collateral marketing spend associated with it as it is now. But if it is done now, it's going to require legislative finding of the BCC under the existing statute as well as us having collateral spend. So when I spoke to Mr. Tusa about it, the point that I wanted to make to him was understand if you commit $1 or $100,000 to a transportation system, as it is now, you need to be prepared to also commit marketing dollars on top of whatever you're spending because you've got to do both. It's not just going to be, if you start funding the system, that's not enough. You're going to also have to market it specifically. So there will need to be defined buckets in our marketing money for that. So if it passes as worded, it might reduce the collateral spend we have to have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Atkinson, when you said that, uh, that marketing has to be specifically targeted towards tourists, it was, that, was that what you're... That, yes, that's what, what we're saying is you have to market this specific service to tourists. So in our marketing plan, it's not just enough to say come to South Walton. It's going to have to have something that promotes this. For instance, we have always had a small portion of our marketing dollars outside of market and a larger portion in market that has been related to beach safety activity. I think we can all remember back to see more of the safety crab is the best example of this. That's one way we have always been able to justify the lifeguards, whereas other counties have not, is because we went years ago, prior to my time and Mr. Tusa's time, and looked at it from the aspect of this is a service for beach safety that we're offering to tourism, and we're going to promote that. Now, we get benefit from it, certainly, by creating safer beaches, but after we had the number of issues back, I believe, probably in 2005 to 2007 range, it became necessary for us to do that. So additional marketing dollars were spent and that justified the expenditure. So same way we put money into that program, we'd have to put money in to say, we have a transit authority. We have a mass transit system. Uh, any number of ways you can tailor that to promote people using that versus using their own vehicles while they're here. 
Thank you, Mr. Atkinson. <clears throat> we, um, Jay, we don't need to uh, vote on this. Just not not on that, but this is just a segue to the next agenda item with the addition okay. of that uh, request to move forward a uh, draft copy of an RFQ for the BCC for them to review and uh, approve. So, um, and I'll just do a little explanation on that. So as part of Structured Parking Solutions um, plan when they came in, um, they had parking, transportation, um, wayfinding, that was all kind of the scope of uh, their proposal. And so they have decided recently, as of recent about a week ago, that's why this is kind of a little short notice with the addition on the uh, agenda, but decided they did not want to do uh, transportation, but they would consult with us on that to get the right team in place, to get the right equipment in place. And so with that being said, um, I think it's very prudent that we move forward with our own RFQ to see what we can do for transportation. Um, I would say that we're probably going to be very optimistic if we think we can get this done for this season, but I still think it's worth going ahead and at least trying. Uh, we may be able to get it in place for this season, depending on what all those moving parts look like as we move through this process. Uh, what you have in front of you is a draft copy um, that has not been vetted by legal or purchasing, so that still needs to take place, but I'm hoping I can get that done and get it on the agenda for the BCC meeting in three weeks. Not next week's meeting, but in three weeks. I think that might be doable. Um, so again, that's just the draft copy um, that has not been seen by either legal or purchasing. So I think it'd be smart for us to go ahead and do this because um, we have no idea what we're looking at for a system. I mean, we don't know if this is gonna be a million dollar transportation system or a $5 million transportation system. So I think it'd be smart for us to see what this system looks like so we can plan accordingly. Is this something that, um, you know, the TDC, um, what portion of this would we underwrite? What portion would the county underwrite? Uh, are there any grants out there for us to help underwrite the cost of this program? You know, perhaps for vehicles or uh, future uh, purposes way down the road. Uh, maybe it, it involves a uh, separate travel lane for this transportation system. So those are all things that we need to look at. So anyway, um, that's why I put this on here. Like I said, I'd like to request to move this forward to the BCC. Um, so they can approve it uh, for us to advertise the RFQ. <clears throat> Jay, this might come later, but being the fact that this could be a large contract and we have more than one transportation company in the county, mm -hmm. would it behoove us to consider dividing the pie, if you will? Like that way we can focus on certain, or not focus, but separate the regions, different companies, and have multiple companies in the county benefit? You know, I'm not sure from a transportation system if that would work. I mean, it's something we can certainly look at as we're putting this together. Um, I, I would have concerns if you have one company in one area and one in another, just them connecting and, and, and working together um, for the, the system uh, to work properly. It, there might be some problems there, but I, I think it's certainly worth looking at um, to see if it's something that two companies could, could work at. Um, you know, and I also think it just depends on what we get back proposal-wise. Like I said, I, I think it'd be a tall order for us to get this up and running by this season, to be honest with everyone in the room. Um, but again, like I said, it, it's worth a shot. Um, I mean, I, I will say that, you know, as far as budgeting goes, I mean, we have no money in our budget right now to pay for this. So even if we come back and go, okay, it's gonna cost us a million bucks. Uh, we don't have an extra million dollars in our budget, so we'd have to go carve that out of something else and then we need to prioritize okay do we want to cut whatever that million dollars is allocated for to pay for this so um, that's why I said I, I think in all likelihood it's probably not going to happen this season just from a lot of standpoints but it, it we need to start the ball rolling on this process um, you know I've been here almost two years now and uh, it's something that I've been working on since the day I walked in the door and um, it's been a little slow but we're, we're, we're getting there it's been baby steps but I think it's important to our community that we have public transportation uh, for our community. So any other questions on the RFQ? Jay, is this essentially the same comprehensive proposal that was presented to us back in December? Um, this is not. This, this is different. This is just transportation, just transportation. where um, the parking is still on the table for structure parking solutions. So they're still working on that. Um, they are getting their plan together. They went and presented to the board, I believe, two or three meetings ago. Mm -hmm. And um, so they are putting their plan together to bring back to the board, which they plan to do so within the next um, probably two meeting cycles. 
just one additional comment, Jay. I agree with you that <clears throat> when we're dealing with this kind of money, which <clears throat> appears to be quite substantial, um, uh, I, I, I would advise that we move slowly but mm -hmm. steady. Yeah. Um, and I, I think this is the first step, and we get a reaction from the county commissioners, and then then we move forward with with our recommendations. <clears throat> But to see this happening this year is probably, I agree with you, yeah. probably not going to happen, especially since we don't have any money budgeted for it. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, uh, that's the only comments I want to make. Um, any other comments from council members? <clears throat> uh, we're going to need a motion to uh, forward the uh, recommendation to the BCC to advertise a request for qualifications for a public transportation system in South Walden using the draft RFQ outlined and attached. I'll make that motion. I'm sorry. I'll make the motion. I'll second. A motion made and second. Any further discussion? Any public comments? <clears throat> Ma'am? <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Coy Good morning. Bowman, B-O-W-M-A-N. Uh, could you say that again? I'm sorry. So Coy Bowman, B-O-W-M-A-N. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to let you know that when you say the words mass transit, um, the locals cringe because that sounds like trains and buses and giant automobiles. Um, so I don't see why a million dollars needs to be spent on a solution that could be very easily solved by just bringing back a couple of those small shuttle uh, that used to go up and down 30A a few years ago, um, kind of like the size of those red bar buses. They're not full-sized buses, so they wouldn't take up a lot of space on the road, and it wouldn't require any kind of structural change to the road. Um, <clears throat> and, sorry. Um, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I had another point. Um, take your time. Um, oh God, I'm so sorry. The little buses would be enough, and we wouldn't have to spend a million dollars or five million dollars. Oh, the other solution to causing uh, to solving a lot of the traffic problems would be to get rid of all of the oversized trucks that are too big for 30A and the other small residential um, areas that are down here. Like, there is no reason that 18 wheelers need to be going up and down 30A. It's ridiculous. The road's not strong enough. It's not wide enough, and it causes problems with tourists to have 18 wheelers and dump trucks, which are extremely dangerous, uh, driving down that tiny little road. Um, also, I think that if uh, the check-in, check-out day wasn't so uh, rigorously encouraged to be Saturday and Saturday only, that would solve a lot of the Saturday problems with traffic because if we encouraged rental agencies to rent Fridays, Saturday, and Sundays as check-in, check-out days, then we wouldn't have this insanity on Saturdays. And speaking of which, um, I don't think there should be any construction allowed on Saturdays because of the check-in, check-out day being so big on Saturdays. There's no reason we need to have dump trucks and construction workers taking up space on the roads if we are going to keep just Saturdays. But anyways, back to the point of transportation. I'm sorry, those are just other solutions to relieve traffic on the road. Um, so get rid of the big trucks on the road that don't belong here and are too heavy and too big for the roads that we have. And then just bring back a couple of those little tiny buses, like the red bar buses, to go up and down 30A like they used to. And then we won't have to spend any money, million dollars, five million dollars, on any kind of transportation. Because it sounds like, from what Mr. Atkins said here, that um, if you're going to do this and use tourist dollars, TDC dollars, then you won't be able to have buses that just go from Defuniac to 98, like which was one of the proposals, was to get people from the n north part of this area down to the beaches, that that would have to not be tourist money because there's not tourists in Defuniac. Um, so it sounds to me like you're going to have problems there uh, with your original idea. Uh, and uh, I just want to let you know that when tourists hear mass transportation, they just cringe at the idea. And nobody wants buses, big buses on 30A. Uh, anyways, that's. <clears throat> Thank you, ma'am. And, and just real quick to a couple of Ms. Bowman's uh, points, uh, we are looking at small vehicles. Uh, we are not looking at large vehicles on 30A Scenic Golf Drive or the connector for 98. Uh, we are looking at uh, something similar to what John Finch had with Sunshine Shuttle with his Turtle Express. So smaller vehicles, trolley-type style, um, trolley style vehicles. Uh, we want to make it a fun experience. 
Uh, we also don't want it, you know, big giant buses driving around on scenic Gulf Drive and 30A. So, uh, but however, those vehicles are expensive. I mean, those, those trolleys that John Finch was running, those are about $100,000. So, I mean, don't, don't be fooled that, you know, we can go buy a vehicle or two and we're going to spend next to nothing on it. For this type of a system, you're talking probably at a minimum 10 vehicles at $100,000 a pop, there's your million dollars. So, is the trolley size in the category of big, big bust for, uh, to Ms. Bowman? Or? I, I believe not. I you're, think. You're, you're speaking like a big uh, Greyhound bus, uh, correct? There were a couple of trolleys that seemed a little large to mm -hmm. me, uh, but there were some that were not, that, mm -hmm. that seemed to be more appropriate. Yeah. Um, however, I thought that there was also, there was already a couple of companies that already owned their own buses that, that when we used them before, mm -hmm. the county wasn't spending money for them, they were their own in well, I'll address that. So, um, obviously, John Finch, you know, he had his model of what he was doing. He was running one bus uh, for a couple of years. I think this past year he ran two buses. Uh, but, you know, with John's model, I mean, it's a pay to play. So, if you're willing to cough up, and I'm not sure what he was charging for those stops, but if you're willing to cough up the cash for him to stop at your uh, establishment, he will. If you're not, then he's not going to. So, I don't think that is full service of what we want to provide to our guests when they come here. You know, we need people to get to our beach accesses. We need people to get to our 16 beach neighborhoods. We need people to get to our state parks. We need people to get to everywhere where they need to go. So I don't think it's very relevant if it's just saying, well, I'm going to stop here at this XYZ place, but, and I'm going to take you way down here because I'm not stopping in between because no one's paying me. So I think that model's a little flawed. So I think if we're going to serve our guests, we need to have dedicated stops. And I think this shuttle needs to be free or close to free because I just don't think people are going to pay a lot of money, especially initially, to ride this shuttle. So I think those are some of the things that we need to look at as we put this RFQ together. And, and I'm not sure if you've had a chance to um, look at that. Obviously, you've only had a few minutes here this morning. But, you know, take some time, look at that document. We have some of those stops outlined in there. Uh, we have kind of an idea of some vehicles that we're talking about, the smaller size vehicles. So. Um, you know, this is just the first step in this plan, and it's, I think it's going to take us some time to get it right, and we need to make sure that we take that time to do that. Yeah, I, I would probably recommend that <clears throat> you might even want to do another subcommittee or special committee mm -hmm. for this to kind of see as a vendor and what would benefit okay. the, 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 you know, the retailers and vendors to, what would they like to see? Okay. I'd be happy to. Clay, do we need a motion for that, for a subcommittee for transportation? It's, it's, the I'd go ahead and have the board establish it as that. It wouldn't be a standing committee. Yeah. You'd basically be creating an ad hoc committee on that purpose. Okay. Jay, just clarify something for me. <clears throat> on this RFQ, and I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing because it's pretty right. thick. <clears throat> uh, are, are we asking uh, the BCC to look at uh, this transportation request in regards to getting bids from vendors or underwriting it through TDC funds and operating it as a TDC entity? No, it is not uh, from the TDC perspective. This is just, and this is just a request for qualifications. We'll review the qualifications, and then we'll perhaps put out an RFP based on those qualifications. Two outside vendors? To, correct. Okay. So That's the way it's structured right now. That may change after purchasing and legal um, sees this. Like I said, they haven't seen it yet. So they... That, that's my thinking and what I was when I was putting this together was to do it that way so we kind of see what the qualifications are and then based on the qualifications allow them to bid on it. Well, um, it, it I'm a little confused now because yeah. a few minutes ago you were talking about spending just a, as a an idea mm -hmm. 10 buses at $100,000 right. is a million dollars. Right. Would that be the TDC buying those buses? Well and uh, for the RFP actually it, we're requiring that we the county that's the way everything's identified in that RFP because the TDC doesn't interact with contracts. Right. It's right. the county. But the county would lease it and then allow that company to use the buses that we lease. So that way we maintain control. So let's just say we hire a vendor and after a year you go, you know what, this relationship isn't working out. We want to get rid of you and we want to bring somebody else in. We still have our fleet of vehicles and we don't have to worry about them walking away with their 10 buses and we're kind of left high and dry. So that, 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 that's the way it's proposed right now. Um, so when you mentioned that, that number, that number is going to go out to a vendor who is going to come back with a proposal and say, all right, to do this, I'm going to have to buy 10 buses, right. not the TDC. Right. right, right, exactly. So I think they give us back a number, and then based on council's opinion earlier, I think based on that number, then we need to figure out how we're going to pay for it. What's going to be underwritten by the county? What's going to be underwritten by the TDC? I don't think it would be solely underwritten by the TDC based on Clay's interpretation of the Attorney General opinion. 
Um, now, you know, where things are right now with the legislature, you know, and where we can spend dollars, that may change in the next few months. Well, and let, let me add this. Even with the current bills, there's an important footnote to the Attorney General opinion. I believe it's the last footnote in that opinion that calls back to something I think all of you are familiar with. I know the Board of County Commissioners is, and that is that we're prohibited by the Constitution from spending tax dollars that the government has received for to aid a private entity. So to get around that, you must find that what you're spending the money on, if it is going in any way to a private enterprise, serves, I believe the language is a paramount public purpose, and that the benefit derived by the private entity is incidental in nature. So the general rule of thumb, while I don't know there's any case law out there, is we've always said look to avoid a windfall. If what you're doing is providing funding to a service and it's going to create a windfall to that private operation, then it is highly unlikely that you're going to satisfy that test. And as the Attorney General notes, that's a constitutional provision that trumps anything under 125.0104, which is the TDT statute. So while whether it's public or private is not the determinative factor, that is under a private enterprise model something the county is going to always have to say. It's going to have to serve a public purpose. The paramount public purpose test has to be satisfied. And then how the funding is structured must only create an incidental benefit. So if what we're paying is dollar for dollar for operation, and we say we're getting X number of dollars in benefit to the tourist that we're serving in return, that may be incidental. But if we're funding the entire operation and there's somehow additional profit derived, we may not satisfy that test. So I think Mr. Tusa's point is very well taken, and I'm sure the county attorney will have the same recommendation to the board that once you evaluate the proposals, a big question is not just going to be where the funding comes from, TDC or the county, but what that funding really creates in terms of a business model. Basically, you can't underwrite their debt for them to profit. That's not ever going to fly. All right. Thanks for the clarification, mm -hmm. Jay. And, and then just one other clarification. Um, you know, we are talking about a South Walton route, East West. Scenic Golf Drive, 30A, and then a connector on 98 between those two corridors. So that's what we're talking about right now. We're not talking about anything north or south. I mean, that's beyond the purview of this uh, body. So um, that is something that the county is working on. So I think big picture, the idea is ultimately to have north-south lines running to get people down south, and then obviously you have east-west. But I think, you know. That's, that's a whole different animal. It, absolutely. Absolutely. Right now we're focused on, this organization is focused on east-west on these corridors that primarily tourists travel on. And can a local benefit from, you know, a bus if they want to go from their house to a beach access? Absolutely. But that's considered an incidental benefit. It is. It is. <clears throat> okay. <Yeah. clears throat> Mr. Bagby, did you want to make a comment? Bagby, one Seagrove place. Morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. How are you doing? Good. The uh, I, I would ask that you send this to the Destination Improvement Committee and bubble it up through them. You know, I, I haven't read it all either. Y'all haven't read it all either. And I can tell you historically, as y'all all know, when we get in trouble, whether it's the uh, building in the state forest or the walkover across Topsail or whatever, it's when something tries to get jammed through. And since we're not going to fund, nobody believes we're going to get it funded this year anyway, send it to the Destination Improvement Committee. If you want them to have a special meeting, they can probably do that. They can answer a lot of questions or give you a lot of ideas. You know, I just noticed that you left out the hub as one of the stops. I'm sure it's a, it's a thing in the making. But when you have two and a half pages of uh, termination language in a 35-page contract or whatever it is, uh, Somebody besides the attorneys needs to look at that, some business people in the tourism industry besides the TDC staff and say, okay, does this make sense? So I, I would just ask, let's, you know, good, fast, or cheap, let's, let's get good and let's get as low cost as we can. We don't have to be fast and we don't have, you don't have to decide this today to send it to the Board of County Commissioners. I would just say, let, you haven't noticed it. And all of a sudden, you're, you're talking about a program you don't even know if we're going to spend a million dollars or five million dollars or ten million dollars. Let's take our time. Let's get it right. I think everybody agrees we need a transportation program, but let's do it right. That would be the only thing I would ask. Thanks, John. Yeah, we, yeah, we've got plenty of time. That's why I think it would be 
quick now to get the ball rolling for the next season. Well, we, we kind of left off where Gary was earlier about forming a kind of subcommittee specific to transportation. So I'll kind of throw that back in your court as far as if you want to make an emotion for that and then we can kind of talk about that role. Well, I mean, it, it, Mr. Babin brings up a good point. I mean, there is a destinations uh, improvement committee. I actually think I said on that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, that, 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 that being said, yeah, that being said, I think we need to bring it up with them. But again, I, you know, this impacts a lot of businesses in the community mm -hmm. and I think they, they, they should be included or invited to give their opinions of what benefits them as well because mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody can benefit from it, mm -hmm. but um, you know, I don't want to keep speaking for Mark, but Mark and I are a little sheltered in our mm -hmm. own little community, if you will, and, you know, I was kind of surprised to hear about, that might be a whole other issue, but, you know, construction vehicles and, and mm -hmm. construction, we, we don't permit that on the weekends and right. the holidays and such. I, didn't, I don't know how you do that for multiple communities. I don't know if there's legality or what, but, so, but this could be a benefit mm -hmm. to improve some of I, I just don't. I just don't go down 38 for mm -hmm. Memorial Day to Labor Day. It's, it's you don't. <laughs> I don't have a choice. You're invited. <laughs> Come on down. So, yeah, I, would, I, would like, I would like to make that motion to to. Uh, uh, I don't know what the motion needs to be, but to make a motion to consider this transportation and invite businesses to come and discuss how they would benefit. Does that make sense? So would, would you like to make that part of the Destination Improvement Committee, or do you want to do a, a separate? Yeah, let's do that. Let's okay. do that. We can do it with the committee that we have. We don't okay. need to continue creating other committees and such. Jay, I made earlier the mm -hmm. comment, let's, let's go slow on yeah. this. And um, <clears throat> I agree. None of us have read this, yeah. number one. And, and I'm a little uncomfortable about voting on something that, that none of us really understand mm -hmm. completely. And I agree with Gary that um, we need some input mm -hmm. um, from the people that are going to be affected, which are the businesses. Um, so I, I certainly support what you're saying, Gary, and, and Jim Bagby's comments. Um, so um, I just wanted to verbalize that. But uh, we have a motion. Um, no. So to proceed, we'll need a second on that. Now, Mr. Chairman. I believe so, we had a motion on the RFQ that we would need to rescind before we can vote on Gary's new motion. So he would have to withdraw that motion, and uh, Mr. Richard would have to withdraw his second before we can vote on this motion. Okay. Well taken. Who wants to withdraw first? <laughs> well, you need to go first. You, you can, well, he, he, well, technically, we can do that new motion in the form of a substitute motion, which if it, it with which it succeeds, it replaces the prior motion. Um, and then if the action of that substitute motion necessarily precludes the action requested by the first motion, there's no need to take action on the first motion. So we can do it through the form of a substitute motion if your current motion you're willing to style it as a substitute motion, Mr. Brillmeyer. I would make the motion that Clay just said. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to make the motion to substitute. Second. I have no idea what he said. But. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? <clears throat> All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Those, aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Chairman, just so everybody's clear, obviously what we've done is we have deferred this decision by sending it to the Destination Improvements Committee to gain more information and task staff with uh, continuing to evaluate this. Because the TDC has referred it to an advisory committee, it would not be appropriate to take action on a recommendation of the BCC until that advisory committee is weighed in. So your prior motion is not necessary. So just for the record, now we have that in the minutes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Atkinson. So we'll have that meeting, and we'll bring this back to you at the next uh, council meeting. You know, Jay, if we get this done by next year, um, since we have the, the, the monetary issue to deal mm -hmm. with, and obviously the timing issue, and obviously some possible mm -hmm. legislative, legislative mm -hmm. issues, I think this is the right way to go, and, and I'm real comfortable with it. And I, I think yeah. you probably are, too, since... Yeah. 
it, it, it would be nice if we had, can try to have this wrapped up by uh, September before the board adopts their budgets for next year so we can have an idea of what we're looking at dollar-wise for next season. So, I agree with I that. mean, I, I, we have time, but we just we can't rest on our laurels and say, okay, well, we, we're talking about something next summer, you know, a, a year and a half from now, because really with the budgeting process, we don't have that much time. So we'll just we'll get this moving along. We'll bring it back to the Destination Improvement Committee, and then we'll bring it back to you guys at the next meeting. That sounds good. One more, one more thing, Mr. Chair. Sure. Maybe since we can get that budget, if put it in the budget in mm -hmm. September, maybe as a you know how October. You look at these numbers we have here. Yeah. October, November, and December starting to pick up some too. Mm -hmm. Maybe kind of do a light uh, rollout mm -hmm. and kind of get some space, some spots already put into the system. So you can get prepared for the spring. Mm -hmm. I mean, just just an idea. I think it would be a, behoove us to kind of work out some bugs okay. and not try to do it all at once. Okay, that's a great idea. We'll discuss that at the meeting as well. Okay, um, our next item of business is 180142, uh, request recommendation to the BCC to evaluate property located on Highway 331 South for a new TDC facility. Uh, Jay, I think that's your item. That is. Uh, so we have um, several pieces of property um, located on 331 just north of the uh, South Walton High School. It's in between South Walton High School and the bridge. Um, it is on the western side of 331, so it is on the right side of 331 as far as uh, visitor centers goes. Um, you know, this has obviously been something that's been talked about way before my time here before Mr. Bagby's time when he was executive director, uh, all the way back to Don Malaterno. So it has been something that's been discussed for quite some time, and that is the basic need for a new facility for the TDC. Um, we do not have room at either one of our facilities for beach operations or the admin visitor center side of things. So um, this is an opportunity. There's three parcels um, that are connected. Uh, in total, it's 4.4 acres. Uh, one parcel is about two, and the other uh, parcels are about one acre each. Um, so this is a great opportunity for us. Um, you don't have these opportunities, especially on 331, come along every day. So um, I happen, I've been looking for a new facility for quite some time, and so um, I think this might be a really good fit for us. Um, I went, when the Sandcastles building, uh, the signs came down since Sandcastles, um, moved out and ultimately closed. Um, I've been kind of looking to see what's going on over there. So one day I decided to stop and saw a sign on the door and, uh, you know, for information to call. So I called and uh, spoke with the owner and he was actually interested in uh, doing maybe some type of a lease uh, with the property. And when I explained who I was and what I was interested in, he said, well, he goes, I might be interested in selling it to you. Um, so I said, okay. I said, well, let me kind of look and see about some other properties because this piece isn't big enough for to see what we can do. So I contacted regional utilities on the parcel next door to that, and um, they are interested in selling that piece as well. And lo and behold, the third piece is actually for sale. Um, it is um, a plumbing company right now. And uh, that piece is probably a little overvalued in what they're asking for. They're asking 950 for that piece, uh, the plumbing uh, supply place. I spoke with the uh, real estate agent on Friday, and he said that um, they're not real motivated on price. They are just, I think, want to kind of get their price on it. So we'll have to see about that piece and what that's going to look like as we move forward. But I think the other pieces are kind of in line based on my conversations with the owners on discussing appraised values uh, for the asking prices. So I'm encouraged by that. Um, so my, my request to this council is for me to bring this forward to the board and we can begin due diligence on this property. Uh, you know, as we've purchased property over the past year and a half, uh, we do a lot of due diligence on property. We do appraisals, multiple appraisals for each property. Uh, we do a land use report. Uh, we do title searches. And so uh, my request is to bring this forward to the board and um, have them evaluate it and decide if they think it's a good fit to move forward in those processes that I just described. Jay, can I add an additional comment <clears throat> uh, that you and I had a discussion about last week? Mm. Uh, and, and a lot of council members may not know this, but the maintenance facility, which is located on uh, County Road 83, is on state property. Both and, of our facilities are on state property. They're, right. they're long-term well, leases. Right. And, and Brian's facility over in 83, uh, there's five years left of that lease. That lease now, I'm not, I'm, yeah, and I'm not saying we're not going to be able to renew that lease. Um, and on our lease over at the admin visitor center, 
Uh, there's still 25 years left on that lease. So, um, but from a standpoint of space, um, we are tapped out. We can't even hold public meetings at our facility because we have no parking. I mean, we have an extra four parking spots at our building over our, uh, at admin. Um, so people call us and say, even from the county, like, oh, can we have a planning meeting at your office? If it's during the day, the answer is no, because we just simply don't have the parking. Um, so office space, we're tapped out. We have no extra office space. I mean, I have uh, eight people probably in a thousand square foot area. So um, we, we are jammed up. And, and Brian over at his place, um, you know, he's looking to add on and take in one of his bays of his shop so he can kind of accommodate uh, his staff. So we, we need a new facility from many standpoints, parking, office space, visitor center. You know, we've all talked about our visitor center numbers and how they've dwindled over the years. And it's our location. It has impacted us in being able to interact with our visitors. And I think being located here on 331, that would, visitor centers have changed over the years. So there's no doubt about that. And I'm not saying that that's the magic bullet and that our numbers are going to return to what they once were. But there's no doubt in my mind that we can have an increase in visitation to our visitor center if we're located on the right side of the road. Can we cancel the lease on the present building? Is that with the forestry department? It is. We can. Um, and stipulated in our lease, we would return the properties back to their original state. But I would say probably in a conversation, I have not had one yet with uh, the state forest folks, but um, they would probably want to keep those buildings. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, other, the only other comment I'd like to make is that uh, a couple things is that <clears throat> um, the ideal location, since most of the traffic coming to South Walton comes down 331, we all know that. And um, the amount of land that's left available between the bay and 98, uh, you're probably down to your last few parcels. Absolutely. And so I think that um, makes what we're talking about a priority. Mm -hmm. Number two, I certainly recognize the fact that you're out of space. Um, you mentioned that the maintenance facility may or may not uh, get a renewal from the state for that uh, property that remains yeah. facility. We don't know the answer to that, right. but it would also put your whole operation under one roof. It would, and there's a benefit to that. I mean, yeah. you know, right now we don't even have a place where we can, we can meet as an organization. We meet in Brian's warehouse when we need to meet as a group. So, you know, I mean, we need to be able to function as an organization, be together under mm -hmm. one roof, and when we need to have meetings, we can have a meeting space that can accommodate. I mean, we have 65 employees at TDC now, so mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're a large operation. And um, we need to function like one. How much space does Brian need? It sounds like you would need the most space. Brian needs quite a bit of space. Yeah, we're, we're actually looking so. at probably doubling what he has now. So it would increase your space as well? Chairman, commissioners, or council members, appreciate your time. Uh, our space doubles as storage space for their commodity as well. So uh, with the new, uh, just kicking around some square footage numbers, we're looking at a 12,000 square foot building uh, over there, uh, uh, if we can fit it on that property. Uh, I think an admin building would look at about 10,000 square feet. 20,000. 20,000 square feet. So uh, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's definitely needed. We're, uh, we're pinched where we are. You know, we've taken on uh, public <coughs> services with uh, permitting authority uh, for beach vendor permits and special event permits. And so uh, our small remodeling we're working on right now is to give us some public uh, entrance space uh, to take care of that need. But uh, it, we're definitely, we're squeezed where we are with our, with, with my department. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Mm. So any other questions for me on this? Council? These properties? Any other comments or questions? Well, I just have one comment. Uh, if we are ever going to get a space on the west side of 331, uh, the time is now. We've, we've got very few spaces left there. Uh, and this time next year, there won't be any spaces left there. So well, these properties don't stay on the market long. No. And um, luckily right now with the two groups that I'm talking to, they're not on the market. Now granted, somebody after hearing this meeting can go knock on somebody's door and say, hey, I'll make you an offer. It, it, it's happened before in the past year and a half that I've been here um, that you know people get interested in the property and go and kind of buy it from under us. So 
Um, you know, I think that we need to obviously do our due diligence, but we need to move as quickly as we can, which sometimes is unfortunately slow, but it is what it is. But we still need to try to move forward as quickly as we can. We also know that it's, uh, it's really a pain to get into the TDC building right. now. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I don't have any statistics, but I would think that uh, the uh, gift shop and all would increase in business tremendously. Uh, people don't want to go to the TDC as they're leaving town. They want to go when they're coming in. Mm -hmm. And if we have a place that's easy access, I think that would that would help with the tourists. They would find out where they need to go, help with the transportation. They may see they can park their car somewhere and ride our hopefully new transportation system. But uh, I think we need to, and I'll make this a motion that I think we need to go ahead and allow Jay to do due, due diligence on this property and uh, see if it's something we can make work, but we'll never know unless we allow him to do it right now. Well, it, it, if I might, um, it should be that I bring it forward to the board for approval right. for the due diligence. Exactly. <clears throat> I'll second that motion. I have a motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion? Um, I just want to make one comment that, that is probably in our favor just a little bit, and that is the property owned by regional utilities cannot be sold to a, a private pro, um, individual. Right. It has to be passed back on to a public, am I using the right term? Correct. Um, entity, so we have the advantage there, but we don't have that on the other on two the parcels. Two. Right. So. And one, one is listed right now, you know, so it's a listed public listing in the other one, you know, the Sandcastles building, it's not on the market, but now that we're talking about it, like I said, it doesn't, doesn't stop anybody from going and talking to that guy and saying, hey, you want to sell it to me? <laughs> yeah. He just recently purchased it. He, he did. He yeah, was he was looking to purchase it for an investment property. And when I went and talked to him, you know, he said, well, he goes, I wasn't really thinking about doing that. He said, but uh, I'm certainly open to discussing it with you. And when I asked him about price, he said, he goes, well, how do y'all usually work that? And I said, we usually get two appraisals and then we kind of negotiate, you know, based on appraised values. And he said, that sounds fair enough to me. So... I think this is, uh, I, I agree that uh, with Commissioner Anderson, this is something that's urgent and we need to get the ball rolling quickly. Uh, prices are not going to go down and your space is not going to grow. No. Uh, let's just face it. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. Any, uh, Mr. Bagley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so when we last left this discussion, where we were was if you, where we're standing right now, all the way to the high school is already owned by Walton County. Okay, the Air Force has a lease on the little tower, and I would suggest that you look at uh, either relocating that, which I think will be a lot less expensive than buying the three parcels that you're talking about. That, that what we're talking about is the reason the whole government center was established, for those of you who've been here for a while. And so it is, there's plenty of land over here in the northwest quadrant of uh, 98 and 331. Plenty of land for uh, Brian to put his, plenty of land for a TDC building. You probably could use the same land. Even if you didn't get the Air Force to relocate uh, their, it's not a cell tower, I think it's a microwave tower. If you didn't get them to relocate that, you, there's space around that to where Brian could be behind it and the TDC building could be in front. And the added benefit, as we discussed the last time we were here, is you have all this parking right here because you're connected. Okay, so all the parking that the chamber uses, that this building uses, that would be available for overflow parking for any events at the TDC. So I, I'm not saying don't do due diligence, but what I'm saying is when you, if, before you bring it to the board, Okay, you better know exactly how much it's going to cost to get the Air Force to relocate. Larry uh, Jones had already, I believe, started discussions with them when we last visited this issue. And uh, before, you, before we overpay for some property, <laughs> which, which we seem to like doing in this county, not just us, but everybody, uh, we, we better know what, what our alternatives are because there is more than enough land in the government center without buying some private property. And it's right on 331. Thank you. Ms. Bowman. Cory Bowman. Um, okay, I would like to uh, mention some statistics I heard, which is that um, 
Okay, the greater Emerald Coast, which is from Fort Walton to Panama City, gets nine million tourists. Two and a half of those million, two and a half million come to 30A. Okay, so then I saw the statistic that um, of those two and a half million tourists that come to 30A, only 1% of them actually go to the TDC building down here on the corner to look at little pamphlets for what to do, which means that 99% of two and a half million people already know where they're going and what they want to do on vacation. They don't need any help from a tourist center to tell them what to do. So now, <clears throat> it was really um, not well thought out to put the tourist center where it is now because yes, it is on your way leaving town and not on your way coming into town, which they should have thought of when they built that building to begin with. Um, but it's built on a conservation easement in the middle of St. Joe Forest Timberland, so that, that's why that was built. But then again, this building is also built on a conservation easement. Um, so my suggestion is uh, right here, let's see, where am I? Parking lot? That building right there is the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I almost never see anybody in that building ever. Like, I've seen people in that building twice in the 10 years it's been built. Uh, so my suggestion is why don't you turn the Chamber of Commerce into the uh, Tourist Development Center and move the Chamber of Commerce to the t Tourist Development Center because then when the Chamber of Commerce needs to have meetings or the one dude that works in that building, he can go that awkward route of taking a left, swinging around, coming back and taking a right. And then the Chamber of Commerce is already on this property with a big old parking lot. The building is never used, and you could turn that into the TDC, and it's already built. It's not going to require buying new land. You would actually use that building. Both of these two buildings would become more functional and more useful in, in their current states. And then you wouldn't have to buy any new land. Okay, so that's my idea for that. I would also like to point out, first of all, there's only two parcel numbers listed on the uh, agenda. I would like the third number. Um, and then I would also like to point out that um, the land behind these skinny parcels is currently owned by a subsidiary of Walton County. Now, um, <clears throat> I don't know if you all are familiar with Joe Elmore's property. He recently passed away and the land was passed on to uh, a couple of women bought his land. And when I was speaking to them, they told me that um, Lloyd Blue was trying to get his hands on that property because he wanted to build an amusement park behind that property on, on that giant parcel that the county uh, paid $1.3 million for recently. Um, so I don't know if this is just a way for uh, the county to get a little strip access to that giant lot behind the property so they can go in there and steal all the trees and frack for gas. Um, but that's what it sounds like to me because I know you can't build an amusement park down here. The land's not strong enough for roller coasters. So. Um, I see this as sort of a, a conspiracy to uh, gain access to a, a million plus piece of property that the county bought in order to get to the timber on there and s steal the timber and not pay timber taxes on it. Because what you've got is um, a perfectly good unused building right here that could be converted into a TDC and a per uh, an unused perfectly good TDC building that could function as the Chamber of Commerce. So. Um, what do you think of that? No comments. Yeah, I figured. So anyways, um, that's First my of all, idea. Ms. Bowman, the chamber building is not big enough for the TDC, what the TDC needs. So that wouldn't work for the well, TDC. Well, okay, but the TDC, only 1% of our touring population actually goes there. So why does it need and, to have And a lot of that is because it's, it's on the way out of You town. would think that. But you see, I have an aunt who was like a serious tourister, okay? She knew where every single tourist stop was from Atlanta to New Orleans. And she would stop at them because she was the type of person that just loved picking up those pamphlets and loved seeing the little tchotchkes that were offered at tourist places. And she, as a tourer, would go out of her way to stop at these kind of places. So the people who are, like, dedicated to, to being a tourist and finding out what there is to do, the being on the wrong side of the road isn't going to stop those types of people from going in and, and being investigative tourists. 
So I don't think that by moving the TDC to the right side of 331 coming south is going to encourage people any more than they currently are. Yeah, it might be a little bit more convenient, but considering that only 1% of all of our tourists actually go to the TDC Center, I don't see that number jumping to 2.5 million people stopping by to pick up a pamphlet to go to a place they've been going to their whole life. I mean, 30A is only 30 miles long. Everybody that's been here already knows what's here. They know where they're going. That's evidenced by the fact that they don't stop at the tourist center. This is just a way for the county to grab up a piece of land that's not in the railroad deed because the current TDC is right in the middle of my railroad land uh, because it's just a lease down there. You've got to get off that land um, because all that land has to be returned to me. Uh, so anyways, um, it's a scam. Thanks. I'll just only add one thing in terms of discussion. I know the county's looked at this a great deal. I know some of our board members recall this, um, and I believe Mr. Bagby who's here probably recalls it as well. It even predated him to Miss Molitorno's time, going back to when the original proposal was looking at the state forest across U.S. Highway 98. We looked a lot at what would be able to be done with the TDC building. Um, that comment about the Chamber of Commerce came up then. The county doesn't operate the Chamber of Commerce. It is a standalone entity. It is a private entity. Um, as such, I think the consistent opinion has been that it would be very difficult for the county to move a private enterprise into a building on land that is, must be used for a public purpose per the terms of the lease without potentially violating the lease, lease with forestry. In terms of whether or not any other county offices could go there, that is a separate question. I think Mr. Tusa's original point he is probably well taken. Forestry probably really doesn't want that building completely torn down. They'd represent it before they might make use of it. But in terms of us being able to put that building to other use once the TDC moves, I just want the TDC to understand either the county's going to use it for a public purpose or it's going to forestry are probably the two options. I don't know that we're going to be able to lease it or work out some public-private partnership because that did not appear to be something at least in the last eight years, the state has been willing to explore on that property. doesn't mean we shouldn't move from that location. I just want to let you know what the future options of that building are. It's either going to be used by the county or it's, probably, or it's going back to forestry. Those are really the two options we're faced with right now. Thank you, Mr. Atkinson. Uh, Ma'am, yes, keep, um, your comment, the, keep your comment short. Okay, no, the, let me finish. Keep your comment short and stop with the hearsay. Oh, you mean like uh, I heard that Lloyd Blue wants to build a roller coaster? That's here. Okay, say. that's here. All I, right. Um, the TDC present, is currently. Present oh. your facts. Be short, precise, because we need to move on. Okay. The, according to uh, the deed, when you click on the TDC, it's actually leased to the Chamber of Commerce right now, who then subleases it to the TDC. Like that's what the, if you look at the actual paperwork, it says St. Joe is leasing that property to the Chamber of Commerce. If you look at the paperwork, which of it, it does in fact say that, but that is not correct. There is an additional lease where we are. How what year was that, Jason? It was 1987 or 88. 87 it was in the late 80s. There was another lease after that one, so it's on the property appraisal website. Is not correct. Okay. Well, so then um, once again, we're dealing with uh, misinformation on the property appraiser's website. I mean, like, I know half the deeds in this town are fake, anyways. But like, um, you know, when you go to look at something that's supposed to be don't, legal, I don't want any. No oh, that's not hearsay. That's a fact. Um, um, but how are we supposed to make a legal decision about a piece of land that doesn't have legal documentation going to it? Thank you. Uh, listen, can we? Can we? Mr. Bagby had good points, and you've got good points. Can we consider both and move on? Because this conspiracy theory and, and fracking, and it, it's not going to happen. And we can just move on and make the decision. I think it's important to know that uh, the TDC does need offices. Whether there's visitors or not, they're sitting yeah. on top of each other. That, 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 that was exactly my point. Yeah. I was going to so, say that, so thank you. So, <laughs> nobody wants that property developed or... Yeah. Trees cut down, fracking, and the well, and, and so, right. That wouldn't be. Nobody would allow it. So right, and, and let's just move on. What what was failed to be brought up in that last public commentary was anything to do with the organization that you have and, and the ability to you know manage this entire process. You know, visit South Walton. Uh, 
you know, it's a large organization with, a, with an important, um, you know, task at hand, and you need facilities to operate, and you need to get... You need to get your people under one roof, and I agree with that. And uh, handing out pamphlets is hard. You know, it's just maybe one small function of a visitor center. There's a lot more opportunity that can be had. And I think, uh, you know, the reason most people don't visit, you know, for obvious reasons, is, is the accessibility problem of the existing location. Yeah, I and I think moving this on for due diligence, you know, the, the Chamber of Commerce idea seemed valid, but we've already clarified it. So. We're open to, you know, ideas, but uh, this seems to be a good one, and I think we ought to pursue it. If nothing else, it's going to be a good investment. If you had to flip the property in a couple of years, I'm sure you'd oh, do absolutely. okay. Yeah. You could flip that property probably in a year for probably double. Yeah. I believe we have a motion and a second. I'd like to call the question. Vote accordingly. Correct? We've got a first. We've got a motion. We've, We've got, got a, a second. We're calling the question. Yes. Call the question. Mr. Chair, may we take it to a vote? Vote. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Uh, this is a request recommendation to the BCC to evaluate property located on 331 South for a new TDC facility. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Great. Uh, at this point, um, I would like to excuse uh, Commissioner Tony Anderson. Uh, he has a meeting in Tallahassee. Uh, we will still have a quorum with his absence. Uh, we thank you for your attendance this morning, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, I have to leave. Safe travels, Commissioner. Thank you. See you, Tony. Um, next item on the agenda is 180143, uh, request approval to commit $75,000 to a joint marketing effort, American Airlines, and uh, Mike Harrigan, are you going to present that? Oh, hi, Mike. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Thanks for your time. I've got uh, a couple of items. The next three I'll, I'll cover. This first one, um, 180143, is a request to commit $75,000 to a joint marketing effort with American Airlines and the Northwest Florida Beaches International Airport. Uh, Mid-January, they announced that American Airlines was coming in for the first time with direct flights uh, to inbound and to outbound a day to both Dallas and Charlotte, Charlotte starting in June. Um, we're excited about this, this news and some additional lift into the marketplace. They've asked for us to commit $75,000 to go into those markets and promote these flights inbound into our destination. Uh, historically, this is something that's come up in the past with American uh, with Southwest with some joint efforts with those folks. We feel, uh, and we've participated in both of those programs, we feel it's a worthwhile program to help them jumpstart their service here and like we've seen with Southwest and some other air carriers, uh, expand that service over time and continue to grow the lift opportunities into the destination. That $75,000 was also requested of Bay County. Um, to do a similar program to uh, promote tourism to Panama City Beach through these flights. Uh, so we would have a voice in that promoting our destination as an option to vacation to with these new flight options. Um, and what that $75,000 would be spent on exactly is still being worked out. We've got some time to work that out still. What we've done historically with success uh, with new flights is gone into the airports in these markets and done an airport takeover with large format signage, uh, raising awareness of us as a destination. Uh, we would also recommend coupling that with some digital marketing in those areas, promoting specifically uh, us as a vacation destination that you can get to from these two uh, cities through flights on American Airlines. We do have the money this year in the budget to cover it, so this isn't a funding request. Uh, it's more of a, it's something that wasn't a part of our uh, original media plan that we put together at the beginning of the year, only because this is a, a new opportunity that came to us, one that we think is worthwhile to pursue um, and that we'd like to, uh, to partner up with American and the folks at ECP to promote these flights uh, and get them off to a good start to potentially see some growth in the future. Mike, for how long is this uh, $75,000 commitment for? Uh, we're still working that out. Um, this is part of this program would be kind of a, a big announcement um, type of deal. So it would be a lot of media in a somewhat shorter amount of time. We're still working on getting proposals and things like that back from uh, the airports in these two destinations. So we don't have that information currently. Um, I would imagine six to eight weeks, if I had to guess off the top of my head, 
Um, but as we get some proposals back and look at some digital opportunities uh, and start working out the budgets, we'll be able to better determine exactly how long the program would last. Is it my understanding, <clears throat> and correct me if I'm wrong, that the visitors that uh, come into the Panama City Airport, the majority of them are coming to South Walton and not to Bay County? I don't know that, to be honest with you. I know that 45% of our folks that fly here fly through that airport. Uh, as far as percentage of folks that fly through that airport, which, which destination they're going to, I don't know off the top of my head, Jay. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. Um, but we know it's the, the top airport for us. Uh, Dallas has, uh, over the last several years, become a very important uh, and growing market for us. So we believe that this will strengthen us uh, in Dallas. Uh, Charlotte is somewhere we don't have a major presence, so help us open up a new marketplace in Charlotte. Michael, um, do you, uh, are we going to be involved in the, the, the creativity of this, this ad? We'll be 100% in control of it. Okay. Um, ECP has kind of, they're excited if we do it, they will not really have a hand in it. Uh, American Airlines is there to support it and supply us with creative assets uh, and anything that we need from them, as much or as little as that may be. Uh, so this will all be controlled through us. We'll be making the decisions on the, what the creative looks like and where the spend goes. Okay, good. Right. <clears throat> Any further discussion from the council? No, I'd like to comment that we've, uh, we've had success with this marketing in the past and the Marketing committee looked it over and approved it, and I'd like to make a motion to approve the $75,000. All right, we have a motion. Second. We have a second. Uh, any public comments? <clears throat> Ma'am. Coy Bowman, uh, yeah, I hear these words, uh, growth and uh, in a room for growth. What did you say? Something like this will really help grow uh, we're out of space. Uh, this island is like a boat, uh, and we are at full capacity now. So I don't see, uh, I, I really hate the fact that they put an international airport in the middle of my forest, um, but we certainly don't need it growing. I don't want to have airplanes flying overhead. If I wanted to live underneath an international airport, I would have moved to the south side of Atlanta. Um, so I hate to hear that there's more flights coming to the airport. I, I hate the idea of, uh, of more flights going through the sky. This county and the neighboring counties already make buku millions of dollars off of tourists, and we don't have any more room for any more growth. So I am against uh, uh, any more new flights coming to the airport uh, or any expansion thereof. So I would like to see no advertisement for this. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I need a motion <clears throat> on 1801-43, a request for approval to commit $75,000 to joint marketing effort with American Airlines out of Northwest Florida Beaches International Airport. I'll be the first to Did you make a motion. motion. Absolutely. We have a motion. Yeah, we had a motion. I mean, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's all in favor. Jeez. <laughs> Do you want your job back? <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a great job, Ruby. It's your first day on the job. You do it all right. Hang in there. <laughs> all right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Great. Right. Thank Next you very one much. Is eighteen oh one seventy one request for approval of staff recommendation for committee members. Yeah, so thank you. So I'll, I'll kind of cover the next two um, together, if that's okay. There yep. are um, two committees uh, that kind of fall under my jurisdiction. One is the Marketing and Communications Advisory Committee, the other the Events, Activities, Arts and Culture Advisory Committee. Um, just kind of a, a general statement about the committees and kind of where we're going with them. A uh, decision was made to reduce the number of members of these committees from nine to seven. Uh, the motivation for that was uh, historically a difficulty in getting a quorum in uh, several of the committees. So we feel that seven is a more manageable number and one that will enable us uh, to have an easier time getting a quorum at these meetings so we can conduct business appropriately. Uh, applications went out for these committees. Uh, they were due back right around Christmas time. And if I could, I'll just go through each of them. Uh, the seven committee members, and I think you have it there, um, were largely held to the makeup of the committee that are in the committee guidelines. Uh, where people who fill these seats have to have certain roles in the community or certain professions. 
So uh, that was a big part of the decision making process. I think the first agenda item is the events, activities, arts and culture advisory committee. And what I'll do, um, you have on your sheet there on the left, the folks we're appointing for two year terms, starting with our upcoming committees uh, and the spot on the right, the previous committee members. So for the events, activities, arts and culture advisory committee, um, we've got Tim Norris as the, the TDC representative, Ashton Burke uh, from the Pearl, Marisol, uh, who is our previous artist of the year winner, Lori Smith from Seaside, Dan Vargo from the Hilton, and Amy Wise Coble from Homeowners Collection. As we went through uh, all, these ap all the applications um, and had conversations with the people that applied and looked through their applications, as well as our history with some of these folks on committees and otherwise, we feel that these seven best fill those seven spots. And uh, with your approval, we'd like to move forward with uh, informing these folks and uh, advertising the upcoming meetings. Are, we're doing these one at a time, aren't we, Jay? Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, so this is a, uh, we need a motion for a request for TDC approval of staff's recommended committee members, as stated uh, by Mike. So move. Second. Okay, second. We, had a, we got a motion and a second. A second. Any further discussion? <laughs> Any public uh, comments? I believe it's Mr. Hagen. Three seconds. <laughs> um, I think Tim was. Pick one. Just pick one. Tim. One, two, three. Tim, I think Tim, <laughs> Tim seconded. All, right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, so I'll uh, move forward then to the Marketing and Communications Advisory Committee. I'm go through, we went through the same process with this one. Uh, the seven folks that we've uh, selected for that are Jim Richard as the TDC liaison, Carrie Parker from Duguid Consulting, Jessica Bracken from Profit PR, Dan Kaiser from Sandustin, Lisa Jones from the Hilton Sandustin, and I'm sorry, Nancy Stanley from St. Joe, and Stacy Brady from Grand Boulevard. Motion to approve. That's the motion. You second? I motion. You motion to approve? Second. Second. All right. Tim, Tim made the motion, Lisa. Second. Sorry. <laughs> Mark. I thought second. he was asking for a motion. Sorry. <laughs> Is there any further discussion? Mm. Uh, I'll just say as a general comment, um, it was interesting reading through all the various qualifications. Looks like, you know, all of these committees have a, a lot of highly qualified people. It's a pity some of them didn't make the cut, you know, because there are a lot of people out there. I'm just delighted to see as many people um, eager to serve and, and do something for our county. So, you know, we, I think we trust your uh, recommendations at the end of the day. And we do invite those who were not selected. To the, the meetings are open uh, to the mm -hmm. public, and people are welcome to come and, and give feedback. So sure. we appreciate their willingness to serve, and we'll continue to engage with those folks um, in an unofficial capacity. Okay. Any further discussion? Any public comments? All right. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you Thank very much. You. Thank you, Mike. Next up, uh, Brian. 180174 request TDC approval of staff recommended committee. Oops. Is that, yeah, is that right? Yep. Yes, sir. Beach yep. management committee. Yep. Brian Kellenberg, Beach yes, operations. For the uh, management, beach management. Yep. Appreciate your time. Mike uh, gave an excellent intro into. Uh, how we uh, go through the uh, selection process. I won't belabor you with that again. Uh, beach Management Committee is uh, the committee that deals with uh, basically beach policies. And so the uh, members that we have uh, recommended for the 2018-19 are Brian Christensen uh, from this board, Matt McGarrah for the South Walton Turtle Watch seat, John Henderson as a uh, member of the uh, Construction Plan and Engineering Community, Matt Allen for the uh, State Park System, or FDEP. David Vaughn as uh, SWFD representative. He's our uh, beach, light, beach safety uh, director. Uh, Danny Margliano, he's a local real estate agent. Uh, and then Philip Poundstone is a uh, local beach vendor. So we're asking for approval of those members for this committee. <clears throat> Make the motion. Second. Get that, Lisa. 
I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? <clears throat> Any public comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those, those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. Next thank one is for our Destination Improvement Committee. Uh, this committee deals with uh, exactly what it says, uh, how we uh, improve our public spaces within our destination. And so the members we have uh, recommended for this committee for the 2018-19 appointment is Gary Brillmeyer uh, from this uh, board. Uh, Kelly Anderson, um, she's a uh, local broker and associate. She'll be our South Walton Turtle Watch representative. Kate Johnson is a uh, owner of a uh, local uh, property inspection company. Uh, Matt Allen or his designee uh, from the state park system. Uh, Chief Talbert from the fire district. Uh, Mary Lou Maris is a local real estate uh, uh, broker. And Lee Moore is uh, the director of community affairs for the Howard Group. Can so someone we, uh, sit on more than one committee? Pardon me? Can someone sit on more than one committee? No. Uh, well, you know, we're, we're tied in to, um, on that particular seat to the state park system, uh, FDEP. Right. And so Matt Allen is the uh, manager for uh, Graydon Beach and for uh, Deer Lake. And so we, uh, at our previous year or two-year appointment, Matt, Matt uh, sat in on most of the meetings and then uh, after the HSDR project uh, sort of went by the wayside, uh, he sort of, you know, uh, asked if he could be, I wouldn't say excused, but it was understood. So this year we uh, approached him again and said, hey, you know, we, we really need your representation uh, on this. And he said that he, either he would attend or his designee would attend one of the uh, committee members or meetings. And so it'll be the same person for each committee uh, for the duration of the appointment. He just has not made that designee uh, uh, available to us yet. So I would like for Matt himself to sit on the beach management committee and then one of his uh, associates uh, in a management capacity to sit on the destination improvement committee. And so he's working to find that particular person. Okay, and that doesn't cause any legal issues or anything like that, right? I, mean, I don't believe so. That's Clay, Clay uh, you need your I apologize. Mr. Tucci was suggesting that what we would do is we would appoint that as a designee um, for the Grayton Beach State Park or the State Parks Park Manager as we've traditionally filled it with those positions, but we'll bring the name back for that specific appointment at a later committee, and that would be my recommendation based off that. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? Any public comments? Make a motion to include to approve the appointees. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, you, next item of business Good. is hey, a uh, request to uh, uh, revise our Brian. view. Hold up, I'm sorry. Uh, just one quick thing. Uh, the next step in this process is uh, for the committees, they'll elect their chair and their vice chair when they meet. And then what we'll do is once they elect them, we'll bring that back to this body so you can confirm that at the next meeting. Gotcha. Thank you, Jay. Okay. Next item of business is a request to uh, revise our vehicle uh, uh, purchases for this year for the beach code enforcement. Uh, currently, we drive uh, Chevrolet uh, 1500 crew cab trucks. Uh, in an effort to uh, reduce our footprint on the beach, I have... Um, uh, been looking at smaller vehicles and so what I'd like to do is instead of purchasing for the 2018 FY budget we had one uh, Chevrolet crew cab a uh, Honda Foreman which is a ATV and then a John Deere Gator which is a UTV uh, in the past we, we we don't use our ATVs and UTVs that much mainly because we have all of our computer equipment in our trucks and since we enter th everything into a live database that we also have to re you know, retrieve information from. Uh, we need a vehicle that can support all that. So my request is is to uh, not purchase the Chevrolet Crew Cab, the Foreman and the Gator, in lieu of purchasing two Jeep Wranglers. These will be 2018 models. Uh, it's the uh, Wrangler Sport two-door model. Uh, they'll be their base model. Uh, it's got a 3.6-liter uh, uh, V6 engine in it. A few upgrades that work on the beach. One of them is aluminum wheels, some running boards, and a uh, anti-slip uh, uh, rear end. 
And so uh, we can purchase those off the uh, sheriff state contract for approximately $28,780 apiece. Uh, that comes to $57,560, which is slightly below the $61,500 which we had budgeted for the other three vehicles I mentioned. And so the request is uh, approval from this board to change this in our FY18 budget and also a recommendation to the BCC to approve. Yes, sir. Brian, <clears throat> would you do me a favor? Sure. Would you promise me that, when we, that if this passes, we don't tint the windows so that you can't see who's inside? Sure. The code enforcement officers' vehicles today, in my opinion, are very intimidating. Okay. You can't see who's in the vehicle because the windows are all blacked out. Yes, sir. And mm -hmm. I think it's very intimidating for tourists. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the idea of having a Jeep out there um, that looks like it's part of the destination. Uh, it's, you know, we can make them attractive. Yeah, we'll put some uh, and, and logo them, on it. Make them where they're um, mm -hmm. open to communication with, with people on the beach. Right now, you've got this guy driving up in a black truck. It says code enforcement in small, real <laughs> yes, small sir. letters. I agree. When he comes at you, you don't know what's going to happen because <laughs> you don't know who's inside. Right. So, I agree. Uh, as, uh, as tourist friendly as we can make these things, I, I think it's a great idea, and, and I, I love the change uh, that you're recommending. Um, Appreciate it. Sure. But promise me no, no tinted yeah, we'll, windows. That's already one of my uh, uh, things I'm going to be changing here in the near future is okay. uh, uh, reducing that tent level. All right. Thank you. Right. Right. <laughs> right, Mr. Chair. Um, are these going to have, and that's a great idea, two doors, four doors? Two door. Two it'll doors. be a uh, black hard top, white body. Uh, we'll put an appropriate logo that marketing comes up with on the side of it uh, that identifies who we are. And this and, is uh, for the ambassadors to kind of cruise up and down? and. No, no sir. We actually like the ambassadors to use the UTVs. The UTV, uh, okay. uh, since they don't have the same uh, requirement of uh, data input and retrieval, mm -hmm. uh, it's easier for them to use ATVs, UTVs. And also last year I was, I was fairly successful in doing static uh, exercises with the beach ambassadors. So we put them static at a regional beach access and uh, uh, intercepting people as they come you know, through the access point as opposed to walking up and down the beach. Yeah. Uh, it's easier to get people to leave stuff in the car than to take it back to the car, mainly tents. Right. But, uh, so now this, this will be just for uh, code enforcement. We have a three-year uh, uh, rotation uh, plan with vehicles. After the third year, uh, maintenance on them tends to go up. And so uh, this will help start our rotation of uh, the uh, Chevrolets uh, out of the fleet. And uh, eventually, you know, we'll have uh, all small Jeeps that are uh, easier to maneuver, less intimidating, uh, serve us better, I think. It's expensive for these Jeeps, and that's a pretty good price. It is. Uh, you know, we buy everything through state contracts, mm -hmm. and uh, we do like to upgrade them a little bit. Otherwise, you know, those parts, you know, uh, you know, steel rims just don't work good in a golf environment. So we like to put bigger rims. Plus, you know, the bigger the tire, the more flotation you have in the sand. Great idea. I remember the gators were requested and approved because of the eroding, navigating the eroding beach on the yeah. east actually, end. Is that? Yes, sir. That was actually for beach maintenance crew. Yeah. And we do use those. Okay. Uh, uh, during the uh, you know uh, winter and spring months, we lose a lot of beach in that area, and so yes, we do deploy our gators on a routine basis to pick up garbage uh, off the beach. So this doesn't. This no, sir. This is for beach code enforcement. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, Perfect. That's it. Okay. We need a motion. We. Yeah, I need a motion on this. Motion to, to approve. I'll mm -hmm. second. I have a motion and second. Any further discussion? Any public comments? Ma'am. <clears throat> Corey Bowman, yes, I would just like to thank you for bringing up the tinted window issue. Um, it is extremely intimidating, and it's, it's, it's been a topic among me and my friends quite a bit uh, recently about how intimidating it is. So I do appreciate you requesting that they don't have tinted windows in the new vehicles. And I would actually like to go so far as to ask them to take the tint off of the current windows as well as the sheriff's cars, because there's no reason to be intimidated by somebody you can't see, uh, especially when they're supposed to be here to protect us and help us. So I would like to see all of the tenting taken off of the current vehicles, right. as well as... Well, we, so. we certainly don't have any control over the sheriff's department's cars. <laughs> oh, okay, right. Another well, <laughs> another ball to issue. Uh, yes, well, anyways, I just wanted to thank you for that, because we have compared it to sort of a... Uh, 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 
Well, I'm not going to go that far. But anyways, yes, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Brian, thank you. All right, uh, next is 180160, Scenic Quarter Foundation presentation by Lee Moore. Good morning, Lee. Good morning. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you, Council, for the opportunity to, to present. I am Lee Moore on the board of the Scenic Corridor Foundation. And um, for many, many years, the, the foundation has uh, supported landscaping the medians along the US 98 331 South Corridor. So we've been working on this a long time. The first project was the, the crepe myrtles you see down between Mac Bayou Road and 30A West um, intersection. And that was great fun and a great project. And, and then, uh, you know, everything went south economy-wise. So uh, those kinds of things sort of stopped happening. So now that things are getting better, um, we were thrilled to see that the um, FDOT invested in this uh, project out here on 331. We think it's a wonderful enhancement to the primary gateway into the, into the destination. Um, and we have also been part of an effort, as you guys know, um, down at the east end of the corridor to, um, to get some landscaping done down there, which is still very much underway and in, in process. Um, so as, as this has been occurring, well, Jay Tusa um, joined our board on the Scenic Corridor Foundation, and we thought we, it would be helpful and wise to take sort of a more holistic look at the corridor. And so that's where this map, this plan that you have in your packet, um, came, what it came out of. And Jay and I worked on this together. Um, of course, we want to focus on the three primary gateways into the destination first. And the 331 project was just wonderful timing for that. Um, so the Western Gateway is not being neglected at all. It's just that we met with DOT about it and with the roadway widening project going on, um, of course, there's, no, there's nothing gonna happen that's gonna happen with those medians. In addition to that, on a very positive side, they have told us, FDOT, that they're very committed to doing a landscaping project in that corridor once this, uh, just like they did this one, once the roadway work is done. That has not been designed yet, but um, they've asked us to give input to the design when it is done. And they've also said that just like they did here, they will do um, an expanded budget and give the county much more input into the design if the county's willing to maintain it going forward into the future. So we feel that there's some things that need to happen, but that gateway in the next few years will be addressed. Um, and hopefully in a significant way like this one was if everything falls into place. And so right now the primary focus is on that East Gateway. And we talk about the, the airport in Panama City being our primary air um, um, port facility for folks coming here. So that's a really important gateway. It just sort of raises the stakes a little bit that Bay County has recently done a landscaping project down there on their side of the line. Um, so we would love, um, I think we would do something different than they did in design, um, but we would love to have our side of the, of the county line looking great as well in the well, near future. So, <laughs> Lee, um, in my opinion, what they did was, just, I mean, I look at 331 and then I look at what they, Bay County did on the west side of, and, and it's just awful. Um, and I commend you on, on what we do here in Walton County compared to what they did at Bay County, because um, ours looks like a million dollar deal, theirs looks like a five and dime. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Very much. And we want to replicate that at the East End very much. So, so in addition to the gateways, we feel like on a long-term basis, we should try to connect the dots in between and really create this in corridor to be, this entire corridor um, to, to be something special. Um, that would continue to further set us apart as a destination. Um, and so that's where this comes from. And we also know and understand that it's going to be a long-term project. So, so 
we set some priorities and you can see that through the map. And again, you probably looked at this and went, that's a whole bunch of numbers, what in the world? But part of that came from the fact that Commissioner Anderson and Mr. Tusa and I met with several represent, representatives from FDOT recently. And they told us that, let me back up a tiny bit, the county, the Board of County Commissioners has already submitted a request for landscaping funding for that Eastern Gateway to the Florida Department of Transportation. And so um, that is a large, significant project. It, we're probably talking in the million and a half to $2 million range. And to give you a frame of reference, this was a $1.5 million project out here. So um, what they recommended to us is that the county consider submitting multiple projects of different sizes because they may find a smaller pot of money for a landscaping project for us sooner than they might find that larger money to do the more significant project. So we don't want to miss opportunities in the interim. So part of our goal here is to prioritize these and pick a few projects that are high priority of different sizes to submit so that they have different scale projects on their radar screen for us. And that's how it's numbered? By yes, priority. by priority order. That's correct. And you can see that all the gateways are of the higher priority, and then we start kind of connecting the dots in between. So, so the request today is for some feedback and input from you all on how you feel about the prioritization um, of these. And if you have thoughts on how they're segmented as well, that would be great. But, but what, that's what Jay and I were trying to do, is get some projects of differing scale and sizes so that we would have some different things to submit to the Department of Transportation to be considering. Lee, yes. uh, could you clarify something on this map here? Sure. Um, what is PFS as a funding source and what is TIF as a funding source? Good question. PFS is proportionate fair share funding. Okay. And so that's from traffic concurrency dollars that developers pay in. Okay. So that happened to be used for um, number one, that the landscaping down at the eastern end of 30A. Um, and then TIF is um, tax increment financing, so that's the South Walton TIF that's been put into place. Um, and those dollars are set aside for infrastructure and roadway improvements. So we think that that's a potential source of funding. Who knows? You know, it's not up to us to, that's up to the county to decide on funding sources if, if you and, and the BCC decide to fund a project. Um, but we were just trying to think of all the possible funding sources. So. We're looking for um, general buy-in, first of all. We understand that this may not happen in 10 years, of course, but we wanted to set a goal. Um, if it does, wonderful. But what we're looking for is for everyone, hopefully, to support this project and say, we want to work together over the coming years to find a way to make this happen. And then, of course, as I said, the input that we're looking for from you all and then the Board of County Commissioners on the prioritization and any, any changes that you may want to make then and there because that's going to that's gonna drive how we pursue funding. And, and there are also grant funds available, not a lot. So that was another reason for trying to get some smaller projects identified so we could start pursuing some other grant funding as well. So, and then, and then I'll kind of finish up with the asks and then we can go back to discussion and if you have questions. Um, but the, the only monetary ask that we're coming forth with today is that another thing the DOT representative shared with us is that if they receive a request for funding for a landscaping project and there is already a design that's funded and in place, um, it really increases your chances of getting funding from them. They would rather have a, a locally done design that's funded and in place and use their dollars for the install and the construction of the project. So that's we're, we're feeling that we should continue, as we did out here, to do what we can to leverage those potential DOT dollars. And so that's why we're coming today to say, would, would you recommend to the Board of County Commissioners that they put out an RFP or however they do it for the design of that project on the East End um, so that we can get a design funded and in place? They, um, the, the dollars that we're talking about pursuing um, are every year the Department of Transportation throughout Florida is required to set aside a percentage and a half of their road and bridge budget for landscaping projects. 
And so they may do a big project, for instance, the bridge in Pensacola. Um, that's a $500 million project, but you can't plant much landscaping on a bridge. Very, very little, just at the entrances, basically. But so they can spend those extra dollars of that one and a half percent anywhere in the district. And so that's what they look at and prioritize every year. So this April, they will be prioritizing projects for those monies for their next fiscal year, which starts July 1. So if possible, we would really love to have a design in place and, and submit that to them so that when they start looking at their prioritization for projects for funding for next year, we'll have that in for this Eastern Gateway project. So that's the specific monetary ask that we're, that we're requesting today. And then we, we plan to come back in the future for these future phases, but that, that gateway we feel is the, is the highest priority at this point. To, to ease that design thought process, you know, a couple of years back, I think Jim Bagby was involved with that, and that the, like the design charrette, using natural landscaping and all that, is that a good idea or proposed or considered? Or? Very much. In fact, um, you know, that's what we were going for out here because we, DOT gave us in Walton County a lot of input into this design. And when this design first came to us, it was very, very, very different than it is today. Let me say, first of all, it was not irrigated. So that then required that the design of the landscaping be very different. And so um, this is just, look, this is all up for, for discussion and decision. But our recommendation would be that for 98, we mimic this this landscape design. Not exactly necessarily, but there should be a, a, a continuity and a flow to it in our opinion because it's sort of part of our brand right you talked about the the look and feel of the bay county landscaping project so and and I, my hope is our hope is that that also might decrease design costs in the future because you're basically taking a similar footprint and just planting it in different size and shape medians along the way and you may want to have it more intense like this is a very intense design there are a lot of trees out there uh, but this is a very important gateway and you want to have a huge impact when people come in you might decide to, to kind of reduce that intensity in other areas where there's not as much development um, things like that but we like the native um, landscape materials that we see tend to see all through South Walton um, and so our hope would be that it would be designed similarly to this, but probably not quite so intense. <coughs> don't, Lee, don't you need, you're on the DRB board anyway, so it's, we have the particular requirements for certain plants anyway. So those would be some that you would take off, you would use from that list. Sure, yeah. and, and um, we also have very strict requirements from DOT on plant material. And that's all based on width of median and whether it's curb and gutter or not. That all completely changes. So we might have a lot of difficulty planting these larger trees on US 98 in certain areas. Um, and so that's going to all have a bunch of input and criteria that has to be met from both the county side and the state side. And oh, and I'm sorry, let me back up and give you one more piece of information. We got very high level budget estimates from two landscape firms, um, that local landscape firms, just to get an idea of what we might be talking about for the cost of the design. We had one give us a $48,000 estimate and one give us a $25,000 estimate. So we feel like somewhere in there is the kind of dollars we're talking about. So it's not, it's not a huge dollar amount, but it could be critical to get that design in place in order to help us leverage it to get much bigger funds for the actual installation. When you say design, is that just for number four or is that for the whole quarter? For number four. We would need to probably design as we go, I think. But, but I think we can have in mind um, that we would want that design kind of replicated at different, different levels of intensity and I different agree. needs based on the Well, it could conditions. help on your cost, too. You know, you mm -hmm. know what your cost is going to be mm -hmm. with the particular plants and all. Yes. Uh, Lee, um, I think for, I, I, obviously this is a request for funding, and I, I, I don't know if the rest of the council agrees with me or not. I, I, in order for us to make a motion to push this forward to the BCC, I, I think we probably need to narrow down an amount or a not to exceed amount. Uh, Jay, do, do you agree with that? Uh, 
well, just to leave it open ended, it's I, I'm a little concerned about that. I'm not I'm not negative about what you're trying to do. I compliment you on everything that you've done so far. And it's a great job. Um, Thank you. It really, really enhances us. But we're asking to to fund something yeah. without a dollar amount, and and that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. I don't know about the rest of the council. It's hard members. to make a motion. I, I can't yeah. make yeah. a motion. I was missing something. Yeah. I think it's a great. Well, when, when you say a dollar amount, is, is the, the high-level budget estimates that we got good enough to sort of place, like you said, a not-to-exceed amount? Because I, and I ask that because I think you're talking, if we've got an, a budget estimate for 25000 and one for 48000 I think you could very safely set an up-to amount of 50000 and know that you're going to come in probably south of that. But the RFP process is really what will tell us what we're yeah. talking about and then at that point you know but these high level budget estimates that we got we got that to give you a general idea of what range it might fall in so are you saying the rfp will bear that out in Correct. terms of what the cost will ultimately be and so there's really no decision being made at this time to spend anything other oh, that's than correct. to see what the pricing looks like right. well yes. so shouldn't we what, what confused me is that in in our uh paperwork here it says this is a request for funding uh, for design of the Eastern Gateway. So I, I'm thinking here as chair that, you know, I need to get somebody to make a motion in a second for funding. But if that's not the case, if you're going to come back with RFPs and we're going to vote on that, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. okay with that. So then that's my intent. Um, in essence, basically what we're doing today is you're giving, giving us information, but we're not going to be voting on any any request for funding in any dollar amount is that correct that's exactly right there um, it's not a it's just i just a, need that clarified a, in my mind because it's, real it's hard really approval to, to enter the funding process and the first step of I that gotcha. process is to get these RFPs. bids back so shouldn't see. we make a motion for an rfp that's the request really. that's the request okay okay is, that, is everybody clear <laughs> yes, yeah, so this is not asking us for funding for to pay a designer to design that section. We got to have. We got to go through the RFP process, process anyway. Right. So the request so, is to start the process. Now we're clear. So today is informational, and we're going to vote to allow you to go out and get RFPs. Well, not me. It'd be a county. We'll have to go to the BCC. <laughs> yeah. We're on the BC. Well, we will be on the BCC agenda for next week's meeting with this same request. If. Okay. If we have your support, so, that's the so we're going to make a motion to, to yeah to move the request right. to the BCC to go to RFP. I think she wants our that's support. That's the request to go to BCC. I'll make that motion. I will second that motion. Is, am I correct in that, Lee? That's exactly right, and that's okay. the way I understand so, the process okay. works. So the, the, so the <laughs> motion, <laughs> your motion is to move forward. Uh, to the BCC in support of this RFP. That's correct. It'll be to recommend that the BCC proceed with the proposed RFP. Right. That, but he said, yeah. like that's he my said. motion. <laughs> <laughs> we can use Sorry. that. We, we, have Not a, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I second it. All right, second by Gary. Second. Is there any further um, uh, discussion? The only discussion was that the way that this uh, request reads is why there's so much why everybody's not sure. clear of what's going yeah. on now I, I do have another question though because on the top in the top paragraph it, it talks about a proposed 10-year segmented landscaping plan so are you going to be having to present every year to the bcc or and or tbc that's a good question what the expenses are or are they going to be a flat line or? yeah that's a great question i mean I, I think this thing is going to sort of um We'll know more as we, we're just getting started. I mean, this is almost like step one. So I think soon we'll know more what that might look like, and we'll also get a better feel for what the Board of County Commissioners' appetite is for this. That's really important. Hopeful that it'll be real positive. But, but um, you know, I could. we may need to do that. And, and one of the things that may necessitate that is that we may be pulling from several different funding sources through the years. So it's kind of hard to have a you know, a, an overall presentation that you put out there and then you get all your decisions made in one, in one, in one shot. So I think it probably will be sort of coming back every year, but, but what would be wonderful is if it would come into some type of, some kind of pattern 
where we get sort of even a more defined plan in place and we're not constantly just coming back and looking at individual projects. But that, that's not the case today. So that would have to develop. But that would be great and make it probably much easier on everybody. Easier for budgeting purposes longer term too because you kind of know what you're looking at out. Does this tie into the underwalk um, at all? Kind, not really. It's all, it's all happening down in that east end, um, but that's more of a pedestrian cyclist facilitation kind of thing. And while there are definitely traffic calming benefits to landscaping in the medians, but, but that's close, closely tied, let's say that. All right, we have a motion. A second, any public comments? <clears throat> Lee, somebody wants to speak. Oh, okay. Coy Bowen. Um, I just wanted to let you know that uh, the locals uh, think this tree planting here on 331 is just ridiculous. Uh, we hate it. Uh, it's messy. There's no organization to it. It blocks all the left turning lanes. Um, it's so scattered, it looks like a three-year-old put, put it together, like the trees, there's no pattern to them. Uh, they, it's just horribly done. Um, now, I was told that the county didn't have involvement in the tree placement, that it was up to the FDOT. So now the FDOT, that's taxpayer dollars, right? Okay, so now uh, this is irrigated, which means they dug two wells in order to water these trees down the middle of the road. Now, I, as a citizen, am not allowed to dig a well deep enough to get to the drinking water. There is drinking water down there. You just have to go deeper. But I'm not allowed to anymore because of whatever rules, you know, have been in place for a while now. Um, so I kind of think it's immoral to have the taxpayers pay to dig two wells to water trees when we're not allowed to dig a well for drinking water. Um, so why should my tax dollars go to pay to water trees that are horribly planted down the middle of the road? I mean, magnolias in the middle. Magnolias are big and sticky and, and make a lot of mess. What are they doing in the, in the median? I mean, honestly, I think we should be planting fruit and nut trees uh, and, and not just trees that look pretty. Um, uh, so anyways, I just wanted to let you know the locals hate this tree planting out here. It's dangerous because uh, you can't see uh, at the left turning lanes and the organization of it is no organization at all. So um, when it comes to whoever it is that wants to make proposed ideas about new landscaping medians, they need to be aware that the locals hate what's currently out here. Um, and and my own... Uh, I'm a local, I don't hate it. You don't hate it? Well, are, are, you, are you an artist? No. Okay, well then you don't understand then why this is such a mess out here. There's no pattern to it. Okay, all right, well every local I've talked to hates it. Uh, there's no pattern to it, which is not aesthetically enhancing. It actually becomes distracting because you're like, oh, eight magnolias and then six palms and then one oak and then this and this. It should, it should have a pattern to it so that it blurs out of your conscious state and that you're not distracted by the trees as opposed to enhanced by them. Um, but anyways, and then the whole thing about um, it's immoral to make the taxpayers pay to water trees when we can't uh, uh, drink the water out of the ground ourselves. So anyways, uh, just keep that in mind for future Thank you. planting. Any, any other questions for me? Uh, Lee, I just want to say I applaud your efforts and the efforts of the Scenic Corridor to at least get up and make an attempt to make something beautiful. I don't know how many fruit and nut trees we have which are native to this area, but I think what you've done out there is uh, top notch, and I've heard nothing but positive feedback in the local community, and I'm out there all the time, so uh, well done. And I think this is a critical issue, and the fact that you've got the attention of the um, FTOT uh, to you know, put forth money uh, in exchange for us maintaining. Uh, the timing seems right, and um, you know, I think we need to beautify our roads. I mean, there's so many reasons why this is good. Thank you. Um, one, one very specific thing: the, the magnolias did come up as an issue, and so um, the the species was selected carefully. It's a little gem magnolia, is what it's called. It's probably not the, the technical name. These magnolias are little gem magnolias. They're much smaller than regular magnolias, and they don't shed and make a mess like, like regular magnolias that we're used to seeing do. Um, and, and also, going back to a more long-term perspective, I just wanted to make you aware, and this probably plugs in a lot to what you ask, Gary, is that um, 
the, the DOT is starting a um, PD&E, the very first step of design and engineering and environmental, on um, six laning 98 from uh, 30A West down to the Bay County line. Uh, that's slotted today for 2023. My understanding from them is that they would like to move that up. So I thought that was much further out into the future, but it is raising, coming up the priority list. So I say that to say that we may have opportunities during this next 10 or 15 years, whatever it ends up taking, for some significant swaths of 98. That's most of nine, that's a lot of 98 in our footprint to actually get absorbed into landscaping projects from the FDOT. That's one of the things that we're excited about and think this make, this, that makes this much more possible than it's ever been before. So if we can partner with DOT continuously along the way, um, I think we will need some local dollars, especially in, in these smaller chunks. Um, but that's exciting as a potential for seeing some significant mileage get get done over the next year or so. Just want to make you aware of that long term as well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Yes. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Lee, can I ask you a quick question before you leave? Absolutely. There's a sign. <clears throat> it's a, I don't know if it's a handmade sign or what it is, but somebody put a sign up that um, on the south end of the median there at 331 and 98 that says in memory of um, Merlin Allen. Merlin Allen. Yes. Are, are you aware that that sign is there? It's I am the, the reason that sign is there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so Mer did you know Merlin? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, you may know Merlin was a previous president and longtime board member of the Scenic Corridor Association and Foundation. Mm -hmm. So when this got done, this was the first time that DOT has done this, and meaning dedicated a landscaping project to an individual in their memory or honor. So we requested from DOT that, that they dedicate this. Merlin did so much work, count, I mean, countless hours, probably months, years, um, on working toward beautifying this area and so much of what he laid the groundwork and foundation for through the years is now starting to come to fruition so fdot took our request and then uh, um, made the decision to allow it so um, there's that sign at the south end and there's also one as you come over the bridge um, heading south and those were dot specs we had to make the signs based on very specific specifications okay. well my question is this is is it going to be replaced by something a little bit more permanent? That's, it, that's I mean, all we it, could it's get. It's almost, it's almost like. That's all we could get. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, I mean, how uh, they. Merlin deserves a whole lot more. Than I agree. A little, a little <laughs> I agree. And maybe sign. down the road we can incorporate it into okay. something very different. Right, but as I, for I love, signage I in those medians, that's yeah, what I they love require. It, you know, uh, being dedicated to him, but I think something I more appropriate would be. I, appropriate. I, I do not disagree with you. And maybe someday we can incorporate it into something different. Okay. But as far as signage in those medians like that, that's what they required. Thank you very much. And I, I commend you again, too, on a great job that you've done. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for the support. Okay. Uh, next on the – does anybody need to take a break? Is everybody okay? I'm good. Everybody okay? All right. Uh, next one is old business. Am I am I correct? That's Jay? correct. Yep. Um, 180140 VRBO update. Okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to give a little update on this. We've talked about it uh, at the last meeting, and uh, we finally had a meeting with Ashley Ham with 360 Blue to kind of talk about the concerns that were brought up by uh, I guess about a dozen or so bed tax collectors um, a few months back um, in regards to VRBO and how they're changing their model. And um, I have to say, um, I've talked to different bed tax collectors uh, past few months about this, and in my conversation with Ashley, it was very eye-opening. Uh, it's actually much more severe than I thought, and how this is going to affect our local bed tax collectors and what VRBO is um, doing. So, um, just real quick, I wanted to highlight a few things. Um, you know, we talked about some of these things at the last meeting, but uh, their annual subscription rates have been raised uh, from 399 to 499. Um, you know, there is a way now that VRBO can track. And so um, if I go on to VRBO and look at a site, say, let's say a Rivard property, and then I go on a Richards property, 
and book that property on Rivard, then Richard's going to be penalized because I booked it through him uh, versus VRBO because I went to VRBO's site. So, and that and that is ten percent. Correct. Correct. So, so those are some of the issues. Um, in, addi like, in, in addition to the fact that uh, VRBO is going to charge anywhere between a nine and twelve percent premium on the reservation that the guest has to pay. Mm -hmm. In addition to, they are competing with us. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Jay. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, they're competing with us by selling amenities like uh, travel insurance, and you're talking to somebody in Pakistan yeah. who has never seen the house. Yeah. So they are nailing us every which way from Sunday, and most of us are either decreasing our subs subscriptions, mm -hmm. and a number of companies yeah. are completely pulling out. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in addition to uh, what we just discussed, the scenario where they charge Richard, well, if Richard didn't pay it, then they would degrade his listing on VRBO site, and they would put him further down in the listings. They're also taking off uh, website, phone numbers, um, logos of property management firms. So yeah, that's that's been done almost yeah. a year now. Yeah. yeah. So so I mean, they, they're really hammering, um, you know, the local um, vacation rental firms. So we are having a meeting um, on February 21st at 2 o'clock here at the Annex, um, and we're inviting bed tax collectors to this meeting. So if you'd like to come and be a part of that, uh, by all means, we're actually sending out an email today to our bed tax collectors. We reached out to uh, quite a few initially just to see because we had a few dates, a few options on dates, and so uh, we found that the 21st worked best for probably about 80% of our bed tax collectors. So now that we confirmed the date, we're going to go ahead and send out another email confirming it with those folks. So um, very good response from the folks we've reached out to. Uh, we anticipate having a good turnout mm -hmm. for this meeting. Um, so we'll um, keep you updated as we move forward. But we're going to discuss ways that we can work together on ways that the TDC can help uh, in this process with uh, some type of messaging, whether it's on our website or in our ads. And we'll discuss all that at this meeting. And like I said, we'll bring, bring that back to you at the next meeting and update you on that. Thank you, Jay. Mm -hmm. um, just real quick, the next item is just a little update on the TDC ordinance plan. Um, this was bought before you last time I moved forward to the BCC. Just wanted to show you there. That is the signed copy by the board chair, Commissioner Chapman. Um, and, the, and I had emailed this to all the council members, but we had some discrepancy in some numbers, and those were all updated before, obviously, we sent it to the Board of County Commissioners. And what's reflected here is the correct version. Like I said, that is what I had sent you as well. Um, after we had made those changes to correct that. I think we can thank Matt for yes. causing those corrections to be made. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> thank, thank you, Money. Thanks Matt. for correcting that. <laughs> yeah. You Looks good. Key, Matt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so that's it for old business, and uh, I'll be back a little bit later uh, in the meeting for some um, updates. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Downs and St. Germain Research. Um, I've got... Philip down, but that doesn't look like yeah. Philip to me. Philip's, <laughs> Philip's looking much better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm Rachel England. Um, Good morning, I'm Rachel. actually the senior project director at Downs and St. Germain Research. Philip couldn't join us today last minute, so I'm here instead. Um, I'll be going through the fall visitor tracking results, so keep in mind all this data is for September, October, November 2017. So overall, tourism numbers look good. Um, tourism continues to be the number one driver of Walton County's economy, uh, providing jobs, shopping, restaurants, and entertainment options to both visitors and locals. And mentioned at the very, very beginning of the meeting, um, the TDT numbers are up, so that's really a testament to how well tourism is doing. So we follow um, a lot of visitor tracking um, behaviors in this study. And we just want to thank all of our um, properties that continue to help us uh, collect data for this study. Uh, we had over 600 surveys completed in the fall. So I'll jump right in. Uh, the South continues to be the number one origin market um, for South Walton, uh, but you'll notice in the fall, 22% of visitors did come from the Midwest. <clears throat> Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, and Alabama all provide double-digit percentages of visitors in the fall, um, and those states did account for over half of our visitors during that period. Four in ten visitors came from just eight U.S. markets, with Atlanta leading the way at 
and most visitors stay in condos and vacation rentals. People love to bring their kids to South Walton. Uh, over four in 10 traveled with at least one child in their travel party in the fall. And fall visitors spent nearly six nights in South Walton. Six in 10 fall visitors used our many vacation rental companies to book their stay. And while South Walton is primarily a drive market, um, about equal number of, or equal percentages of visitors who did fly uh, used the Fort Walton and Panama City airports in the fall. We continue to attract new visitors, uh, which is very important to the growth of South Walton tourism. About 17% were first time visitors in the fall. And fall visitors rated their experience very highly and nearly all plan to return. Visitors come here primarily to relax and unwind and to spend time with family. And while they're here, they're going to our restaurants, they're going to the beach, and about two and three are shopping in our stores. Visiting parties spent over $4,000 per trip. This is up about 5% from last fall. And three in 10 visitors plan their trip at least six months out, which is a pretty long planning cycle. Um, but one thing to note is about one in four visitors during the fall plan their trip um, less than one month out. So you're still having those spontaneous visitors during the fall as well. One in five visitors viewed the visitor's guide. Um, most of those were viewing it online. About 18 of the 21% were looking at that guide online. And while most visitors have tried several South Walton Beach communities, um, about six in 10 now only consider one when they're planning their trip here. With a significant number of units on the West End um, for South Walton, that accounts for significant percentages of our visitors. And over one in four have seen our promotions on magazines and websites. And visitors describe our area as having beautiful beaches. It's a great place to visit. It's relaxing and it's family friendly. And a typical fall visitor is in their mid 50s with a substantial household income. Um, so getting to these yearly comparisons is a lot of figures. I'm just gonna point out a couple. Um, you'll notice that visitors are up 5% year over year in fall. Um, and with that economic impact is up nearly 5% as well. <coughs> Household income increased year over year to 163,000 in fall 2017, and again, expenditures were up. Um, party expenditures were over $4,000 a trip. Um, you'll notice here that 20% of visitors use the term South Walton to describe the area. That's up 5% from last year, and then more people are also saying that they plan to return this year. Um, you'll notice here that 22% of visitors came from the Midwest um, last fall. That number was 16%. And then visitors are doing more activities while they're here. They're going to more restaurants. They're going to the beach. And that is all I have for you guys today. Do you have any questions? Okay. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, gender communications. Is Catherine going to be doing the presentation? Yeah. I heard a rumor about you. What was that? What was that? <laughs> I think congratulations are in order. Didn't you just get married? About a year and a half ago. Uh, but yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> See how long Semi recently. The <laughs> rumor cycles. <laughs> But yes, Catherine Andrew with Zender Communications. Um, actually, I have a pretty quick update for you today. Um, <laughs> we have our media highlights for the last two, or December and January, as well as our content marketing strategy and social media highlights. You won't see any creati creative updates in this. Um, we are working on a bunch of resizes for existing publications and things like that, but also have some very large 
creative projects going on that Michael gives some updates on um, that we're not ready to share just yet. So, in our media overview, a couple new media opportunities that came to us this fiscal year. This first one is through Time Inc. We partnered with Travel and Leisure and Southern Living Magazines to do articles on their website. Um, as you know, we're trying to do a lot more native articles through digital media, making our content a little bit more um, natural in the digital experience of our consumer. So these articles appeared as Travel and Leisure and then Southern Living articles on their website. And the mention of South Walton was that they partnered with us to develop these articles. So Travel and Leisure's article was about um, what your favorite South Walton Beach neighborhood says about you. So it talked about all of the different personalities of the neighborhoods um, and the, di the diversity of the destination. And then Southern Living focused on the top spots for whining and dining in South Walton. Those articles resulted in over 555,000 impressions. Um, really, really great reach there. And then we also had a ton of negotiated added value there. Travel and Leisure's social media channels have over 2.6 million followers. Southern Living's have over 2.8 million followers. So in the added value through social media on those channels, we reached a ton of people as well. Another new media opportunity, we've um, beefed up our LinkedIn presence specifically for our media, our, our meetings audience. Um, so we are targeting group sales there. We have also gotten um, additional opportunities through LinkedIn for targeting. So we are able to target by job title, function, industry, and things like that. So we can be super, super targeted in where these ads are going. So with the optimized targeting and new um, content, we're exceeding engagement and click-through rate goals. On the added value front, as always, we're looking to have at least 50% of total placed media and added value. So to date, we have placed $4.6 million worth of, uh, or we have, we have a value of $4.6 million worth of media, and the actual spend of that is less than $3 million. These examples are those Southern Living and Travel and Leisure Facebook um, or Instagram posts from that partnership. They resulted in over 20,000 likes on Instagram, which is really great. Our fall digital co-op campaign um, ended in December. All of our partners purchased into that um, program with a guaranteed click number. We also set a click goal for those. Each partner exceeded their goals um, and they all should have received in the last couple of weeks their reports outlining how all of their individual placements performed. Our brand digital performance continues to be super strong on mobile. Um, when we place, we strategize um, to make sure that mobile is getting a little bit more um, of a push than desktop just because that's where people are viewing this content. We had over 7 million impressions, well exceeded that click-through rate on mobile um, and hit it with the desktop placement. We updated our creative for our Facebook carousel ad and you'll see that it is the best performing creative for both um, desktop and mobile. So that's great to see as well. Our SEM recap, we're back to um, well exceeding our industry averages and click-through rate goals. As you know, we had our events grant um, specific AdWords in there um, in October and adjusted our strategy to move to more of a general event promotion ad because it was um, allowing us to be more strategic in our bids and then also um, allocate dollars to the placements that were performing the best. So we're continuing to exceed those goals and monitor that on a daily basis. Our signature events continue to perform very well. To date, we have over 55 million impressions for those um, signature events. That's through social media, display networks, Pandora, and traditional radio, as well as some, as some native advertising. Our experience events are also performing very well at over 18 million impressions. Um, they ran fewer impressions than the signature events, um, just for the nature of the size, and they also are specific to drive markets since those events are shorter events than our signature events. They're not really warranting a, a larger trip. Um, but we had nearly 30,000 interactions with those placements. On the social media front, we continue to grow on all channels. But as we've talked about, we're going to start seeing a little bit of changes in how we are reporting our social media um, KPIs. 
as far as page growth, we actually were above the competitor average this month, but what we are doing in our strategy is adjusting that to um, not prioritize page growth as much because it's becoming more and more expensive. Um, you've probably heard about Facebook's changes that they're making or that they have made over the last month. We were actually ahead of the curve um, on that, adjusting our strategy to make sure that we're not overspending for metrics that aren't important to us. As far as our engagement goes, you'll see that's a little bit lower, and that's because we have shifted to that impression-based advertising. Um, we talked about last meeting that when you are placing for engagements, you're going after that small percentage of clicky people. Sorry, the screen. <laughs> it just <died. laughs> Um, I'll just keep going through. You're going through this for the small percentage of clicky people. And then when you get into our targeting, which is a high household income, that more affluent audience, the percentage of people who click is a lot smaller. So um, making sure to focus on impressions, getting our content in front of our audience. And you'll see that um, how we report on that change a little bit. Only have one slide, and it's not super visually important left, So, um, and you guys have it in front of you, but our content marketing tips and trips. For December, we focused on answering questions that we commonly get from social media. One being, what is the weather in X month in South Walton? And two being, why is South Walton different or better than any other beach destination? So two of our articles focused on that, and they performed very well. People were very interested in that content. And another thing that we're also doing now with our content in this new fiscal year is using our native placements. We add those articles to those native placements through every month. So we're making sure to keep that content really fresh and get people to our site. So you'll see the numbers here. Those are view numbers. Um, the 3,600 for why South Walton is a beach apart is actually now 4,600. And the 1,168 for a beach for any season is now over 2,000 views. So we're continuing to grow since we're placing those content articles, not just specifically in that month, but also in our media placements to um, further our message about the destination. Could you please define native placements? I'm sorry, I just don't know that term. What was it? Native. Native, native placements? So native placements are, we work specifically with a company called Orange 142, and they place content. So if you're on an article, you're reading, I don't know, Time Magazine or something on, on your uh, desktop, mm -hmm. you scroll down, and you know how they have suggested articles at the bottom? Yeah. Our, one of our content pieces is now a suggested article. It does say sponsored by Visit South Walton, but it's native is more in that native environment of where you're consuming content. So if you're reading articles, our articles pop up as suggestions rather than just being a banner ad on the side. I understand. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? So we're not one of those pesky little banners, are we? Not anymore. Good. <laughs> so we're trying to move away from. I like that. And they, it's, you get more quality traffic to your website, and you're showing people what you're giving them once they get to the website. So they realize that they're going to get to read more about the destination rather than just clicking on a banner and not knowing where they're going. That's yeah. Anything else? Are you still married? I'm still <laughs> married. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank well you very done. much. <laughs> happily married she's happy he's married <laughs> Mike good morning again here with the marketing update uh, since we last met wanted to update uh, not clicking through but you've got it in front of you there there we go a uh, couple of projects that are in production that have been for a while now I want to give an update on kind of where they stand and what we can expect moving forward the visitor guide still on track for a spring launch. Um, it'll go to the printer right around the time we uh, convene again in two months. Uh, it's being uh, developed and the writing is complete. We're in photo production, our photo selection phase currently. It's looking great. So we're excited about that piece. Beach neighborhood videos, as we've discussed in the past, we have our 16 beach neighborhood videos that are pushing 10 years old or so. So we are setting out to replace all 16 of those, filming on the first four. Uh, we'll start in just a couple of weeks here before the end of this month. So we're excited about that project moving forward. Uh, some of the supplemental print pieces I want to talk about a little bit. So we've talked about this before, and one thing we set out to do over the last several months uh, has become the authoritative voice uh, in the marketplace on all things South Walton that a, a visitor would be interested in. Part of that is developing a new family of print pieces. We've kind of organized them kind of A, B, C, and D, kind of four tiers, uh, with the visitor guide being an A piece. Uh, what you have in front of you there, our golf guide would be a C piece, for instance. 
Uh, it's something that we can distribute in the visitor center. When people ask for uh, golf information, historically we'd be giving them something that someone else produced that would include uh, competing markets, a lot of paid advertising. This is an unbiased voice coming just from us. Um, so we're excited about this. It's this one you see in front of you here is really an enhanced listing guide. We developed this uh, with our partners in the golf industry to supply some copy and facts and photos. Uh, so we're excited about that piece. Uh, there'll be a shopping guide that will follow a similar format, also in kind of that same C category coming soon. And as you heard Rachel's update, only about 20% of our audience use the term South Walton. Uh, getting this content in their hands either before they visit here or a lot of these pieces while they're here, uh, we think will help push that number a little bit higher and get people referring to us as South Walton and recognizing our brand and associating it with this good content. Uh, the Mike, dining guide I'm going to talk about on the next slide in a little bit more detail. Mike, can I back you up? A yes, sec? sir. Uh, just um, did did uh, the TDC do the um, beach videos on the fishing in um, Hogtown and the fishing trip out out of the East Pass on on um, I think over the country of Western Singer. Uh, yes, we did. So that's part of the Southwest um, South Walton Fishing Adventures uh, TV series. Well, it was on the Sportsman Channel. I had an opportunity to watch both, and I want to compliment you. They were both phenomenal. Oh, good. Thank if you. If you haven't seen them, uh, Sportsman Channel, if you're on Cox, it's 1333 is the channel. And you can look through the guide. There's one where the, a country and western singer and his family go out deep sea fishing. Uh, Happens to go out of distance since we don't have an opening, and the other one was on Hogtown Bayou <clears throat> and uh, catching redfish and that sort of thing. And uh, the Sportsman Channel has an average viewership of around eight million, and I was <clears throat> totally in awe when I saw it. Oh, good. It was well, it was very very well done. Good. Thanks for that so. feedback. It's about halfway through. Uh, we have a 13 episode commitment. It's about halfway completed currently. Uh, it's got some beach launch trips, yep. uh, some bay trips. Uh, the one you saw where they went deep sea so i uh, appreciate that I, I saw both of them and right. there you know obviously there's commercials and and, and whatnot but um, south walton brand and logo and whatnot were consistent you know throughout uh the program and i just want to compliment you they were wonderful great and if anybody hasn't seen them they're worth watching yeah. well thank you for that feedback we appreciate 13, it 1333 1333 on cox uh, is the HD, and if it's not on HD, it's, on, it's just 333. We'll get you the, the regular Cox channel. Thank you. Um, we talked about website redesign uh, quite a bit over the last couple of uh, meetings. You guys approved us putting an RFP out. We moved that to the Board of County Commissioners, and they did the same. We have that written in draft form. We're working with purchasing to get it finalized and distributed. So we're excited about that project moving forward as kind of a top priority. So I talked about the dining guide a little bit. So, and I talked about the A, B, C, and D pieces are kind of unscientific method of uh, classifying these. The dining guide would be what we consider a B piece. It's probably gonna be about 40 pages long. Uh, it's a seven by 10 magazine style piece. We heard Rachel say in the fall and the winter, uh, restaurants are a greater attraction to South Walton visitors than the beaches. Uh, in spring and summer, it's the number two attraction behind the beach, so they just flip flop. Uh, again, we didn't have much of a voice in this space. Um, when people ask us for um, things in the visitor center, they usually leave with several pieces published by other folks who are more advertising driven. Uh, we wanted to have our own voice out there. So this piece, which I'll have uh, to the printer this week, uh, our team has developed in-house, will be a full comprehensive restaurant listing, over 100 restaurants listed, uh, organized geographically by neighborhood. Breakout listings for certain categories like waterfront dining, pet friendly dining. These are the these are driven by the questions we get most often. Where can we eat on the water? Where can we bring our pet? A couple other categories as well. Um, recipes from our old Saver uh, cookbook, if you remember that piece from local restaurants, uh, and say we took the name and used it on this piece. The winners of the Perfect in South Walton Awards in the dining categories, so the folks that were on uh, Best Wine List, Best Lunch, Best, best Breakfast, Best Fine Dining, uh, those will be announced in this piece and featured restaurant articles. So we spotlight four restaurants and those were selected by the four winners of the main dining categories in the Perfect in South Walton Awards. 
Um, we're extremely excited about this piece. We think it's going to be great. All these pieces that we're doing now, we're kind of rolling out one at a time as we can produce them in-house. Once we get them all done for the first time, we'll get to an annual schedule where we're producing them all updated at the same time, so they're not rolling out one by one. We're also working on um, a future distribution channel for in-market to get them at front desks and lobbies and other places around town uh, where visitors can, can pick them up. So it's again about us wanting to kind of control the voice and be the authority on what to do and where to go in South Walton with an unbiased uh, viewpoint on it. And this one I've got to compliment uh, Matt from our communications team and Courtney, our creative specialist, I think are maybe here. And that's here anyway. Uh, the two of them took on this project just basically on their own. So it's pretty impressive. Uh, just a two-person team really put a ton of work into it. And uh, we're excited to get it to the printer. And we'll have a copy for each of you here pretty soon. A couple other things I want to talk about. Uh, we've developed a program called the South Walton 60. This was actually suggested to us by one of our uh, partners in the events program. We have uh, five what we consider signature race events in this marketplace, um, which is rare for a market this size, all very high quality uh, runs, and then the Sandestin Triathlon included there as well. If you do all of them, it's a total of 60 miles. So what we are doing is pulling those resources that exist in the community um, and developing a program to encourage people to visit more often to run more frequently. Uh, even if it increases people coming once a year in the spring to do the seaside race, if they come back to do one of the uh, events in the fall, it's a win for us. Um, we've got prizes. If you compete in enough races, we're developing a medal uh, and some other prizes that we'll ship to these folks. Uh, it's a very low cost thing that we think is going to get some good PR value um, and continue to brand us as a fitness uh, and race destination. So it came to us, like I said, from one of the organizers of the races to uh, get some collaboration between all the races um, and get us all kind of uh, sending out the same message. So we're happy to be, be rolling that one out and see where that one goes. The cooperative marketing program, I just want to give a quick update on. Uh, it's come up in my time here in multiple marketing committee meetings uh, and multiple meetings of this council as well to open the co-op opportunities to more than just bed tax collectors. Historically, it's been a program that only bed tax collectors could participate in. Um, we've been hearing you know, for quite a while now from other segments of the community that they'd like an opportunity to participate as well. Uh, so in the, our fiscal 2019 co-op program, we will be opening certain opportunities to other categories like shopping and dining and attractions in addition to uh, bed tax collectors. What exactly that looks like right now, we're not exactly sure. Um, but that's in development currently, so we're excited to work with those other categories um, and kind of bring them into what we do from a marketing standpoint as well. The last thing that I'll talk about, the kind of bottom right graphic there, if you can imagine, this is um, a printed piece. This came to us through our Beach Code Enforcement, um, and I've got to commend Jeff McVeigh and Brian and their guys uh, for developing relationships with vendors. This was actually a, a beach vendor suggestion for the tags that they use on their beach chairs to indicate who has rented the beach setup. Uh, gives us an opportunity to put out our beach flag warning system. And if you can kind of imagine that visually, the portion that's in gray there, it's kind of an L-shaped piece, the portion that's in gray will slide into a slot uh, that's on the chair. Uh, and this was developed with feedback from several beach vendors uh, that told us kind of how they utilize these things and, and what would work. The portion with the person's name and our beach flag safety system below it will be exposed. So we're reaching people with the flag system right when they're there at the water. Um, we'll print these and make them available to beach vendors. Uh, it helps us probably strengthen that relationship a little bit. Uh, gives us a very low cost way to get a very important message out to people right at the time that they would be needing it. Uh, and this is one iteration, a couple of different beach vendor companies. Uh, do things a little bit differently, so there will also be a, a flat piece that will develop uh, and another one with a hole punch. There's kind of different applications on how people tag their chairs. But a uh, great suggestion from Brian and Jeff and their team uh, that brought this to us, really low cost, uh, easy way to get a very important message out at exactly the time we're trying to communicate it. So we're excited to get that in place for this spring season. And if you have no more questions for me, I'll turn it over to Don. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Good job on these. Yeah. Oh, good. Thanks. Uh, these are good pieces because if there's anything that I know is that 
either they're sitting there in the unit, in the condo, the home, whatever, and you're always looking for something to bring a golf course or go to a restaurant. That's nice, and we've got our name on it. That's right. Yeah. Thanks yeah. very much. I, I love that. I also want to comment that last thing you just pointed out, the beach chair thing where the, the, the warnings, the flag warnings are on the chair. I don't know how much better you can communicate mm -hmm. uh, something uh, to a visitor. Ah! Well done. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Dawn, good Hi. morning. Good morning. <laughs> yes, good morning. How are you? <laughs> Tough fact to follow. <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> Not even going to try. Our, uh, our recent sales activities, uh, we went to Florida Encounter in West Palm Beach. This is an annual conference and it's sponsored by Visit Florida. It's one-on-one -on -one appointments in a trade show format. We had 21 appointments. Um, I think with all the changes at Visit Florida this year, it was not as well attended and, and some changes and some lack of enhancements. Um, so I wouldn't say it was the best show we've ever attended, to be honest, but we did get some good appointments. We got one lead out of it with some potential for future, and we're going to continue analyzing it. I've talked to uh, several people at Visit Florida, um, one who now is in charge of it for next year, and I think it will be a, a better show moving forward. But I, I would say it was a, a good success for us. Um, in addition, we just had our partner Lunch and Learn that was held on January 30th. We provided updates, discussed our future travel schedule for first quarter, and also provided a demonstration on our new software and how we can assist in identifying new potential business. So we have the opportunity for us to identify business and also to help our partners and provide them some good information as well. I think it was successful. Um, hopefully a good avenue to make sure we have a strong partnership and that we're doing the work that best supports them. Uh, I also recently met with both directors uh, at ECP and VPS airports uh, to see what tools we could um, possibly use to help grow our group business. This is going to be a continuing ongoing effort, um, mostly with the airlines. It's, it's uh, it's that relationship that we'll continue to work with. The airports have been very helpful. It's just a matter of how we continue to work together to grow shoulder season business with, with airfare. Uh, our upcoming events, we'll be going to Connect Financial uh, in mid-February in Orlando. This is a hosted buyer appointment only show. It's hosted by Connect. We've done several shows with Connect in the past and have had a lot of success. This is actually a new show. We've never attended, um, and it's a new show for Connect. It solely focuses on the financial segment. So uh, we find that those are higher end uh, corporate events that we have the opportunity to get in front of. So we'll um, evaluate this opportunity. We did offer this as a booth share opportunity, but it came up I think late in the game, so uh, we will not have a partner attend with us, but we'll look forward to giving you some good feedback on this particular event. February 23 through 26, we'll be working with the PR team. We'll be hosting a media fam trip dedicated to the meetings and incentive market. We're excited to showcase our area so that we can grow PR impressions specifically to group business here. Next, we will be attending Rendezvous South. That's in Daytona. This is a partnership with Sandestin, uh, again, a trade show format. It tackles corporate, association, Smurf. Um, so we're hitting all segments for this particular one. It's always been a good show for us, and so we uh, are anticipating great success there as well. March 20th, we will be at the Georgia Meeting Planner International at uh, lunch in Atlanta. This is their monthly luncheon. It's their tech summit. So as we can all see, there's so much happening technology-wise and digital marketing. It is one of the well-attended luncheons. So we'll be exhibiting there for the first time. 
going back face to face in this market. It's been a while since we've been um, participating in our, our Georgia MPI. We feel like it's such a growing economy up there and a lot of opportunity for both corporate and association business. Since we're there, the following day we'll be doing a lunch and learn. We are uh, targeting two events, one at lunch and one in a reception format so that we can get two segments of the, the meeting planners up there. We'll be targeting 35 to 40 people in both events and bringing partners to more educate them about the area, look for new business. We're taking our artist of the year so that we'll have some interactive environment there too. So uh, we hope to have some great uh, options for you to tell you about when we get back from that. Um, continued efforts, we have finalized the meeting facilities guide. It looks great. It's going to the printer next week. It's an opportunity for us to showcase our partners in a little more detail. It has a lot more event space uh, information than the current one. It has a lot of great pictures, which I think tells the story of the destination. Um, we went from a three-panel brochure to a 22-page brochure. So it really mm -hmm. does a much better job of telling the story of the destination. We'll next start initial creative on the wedding brochure. We do not currently have um, information in print that we can send out regarding weddings. So that too will have enhanced photography and a lot more information on new uh, creative spaces too, not just the beach to have weddings, but uh, event space and, and great, uh, great other opportunities for our partners. Um, we also will continue to evaluate the footprint digitally and um, print-wise for our weddings market. Um, we're also working on a special offers marketing piece that will go into registration bags for groups and events that are coming here. It's going to showcase a lot of our local vendors and we're excited to, to keep working on that and that should be done in the next few weeks. We're also continuing our database prospecting with the new software we've purchased um, and excited to just continue looking for new business for the area. Our visitor center stats, uh, we've welcomed 1,061 visitors in November. That was a 41% increase year over year and had a 353% increase in merchandise sales. We had a monthly total of $4,686 for November. In December, the Visitor Center hosted 908 visitors. That was a 23% increase over last year and had a 205% increase in merchandise sales with a monthly total of 4,818. Uh, I, I just want to point out that the $14,000 in merchandise sales is a huge increase, 238% year over year. And we are just now starting a new social media campaign to direct more uh, to our online store so that we can increase even more so for the coming months. So we're excited about that. Any questions? Have, I have one. Have you evaluated how many people you could actually handle in that visitor center and what the needs might be in a new visitor center? Well, you know, we have different traffic patterns. It's really interesting. So um, it, it's probably, I don't know that it's a capacity issue. Um, at times it gets fairly busy in there. I would say uh, right now, um, just this week, we consistently have probably 10, 15, 20 people in there because it is a, a new segment of, of people coming in right now to learn about the destination as they're coming to the area for the month of February. Um, staffing wise too, it's, um, there's probably a lot of different different things to consider. So no, I don't have a, an answer for you as far as capacity, but um, to Jay's point, the parking is mm -hmm. is something to consider as well. <clears throat> You'd probably have more if you had more parking spaces. Mm -hmm. And if they could get two of them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any other questions that I can answer? Good okay. stuff. Thank, Thank you. you, Don. I'm going to turn this over to David. Uh, let's see, Dave again. Yes, sir. David Demarest, Director of Communications. We started on the first slide here of two, so no need to uh, worry. We've uh, got a lot of good 
positive media coverage um, as we round out November and December here. Um, one of the things we moved towards was getting more hits in terms of the um, events. Uh, we think that's a good way not only to get the brand out there, uh, but also to get people who might be open to some last minute travel down to the area. Uh, we're continuing with the, uh, the best beaches type uh, push, best neighborhoods, got some good hits in coastal living and southern living there. Um, and as Don mentioned, moving more into uh, the convention and meetings magazines. We do have the FAM trip coming up later this month for meetings and incentive travel riders. Um, that'll be an opportunity to show them our partners and their opportunities for meetings and group travel. Um, let's see, we also uh, attended IMM, International Media Mar Marketplace in New York, uh, late last month. Um, in the space of a, a single day, met with 30 <laughs> travel riders, pitched South Walton, um, already having some good results from that. The editor for National Geographic assigned a, a story, so we've had some follow-up for there. Um, as far as the pitch themes we're working on now, for this time of year, you're not, you're not talking about the beach as much, um, but people are still very interested in the area, finding out what's new, um, learning about our, architecture and the points of differentiation here as far as that goes. Um, we're talking about spring travel um, and as the Underwater Museum of Art and Suara continue to develop that project, we're finding some uh, good sticky points there. And there's some of your clippings to see uh, the types of stories that are getting picked up and that's a quick overview. And with that, open up for any questions or turn it over to Brian. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good Hello again, Brian. Hello again. I'm glad to say still good morning instead of good afternoon. <laughs> yeah. We're, push appreciate, we're pushing it. <laughs> I appreciate Mike and Don and uh, David with their uh, marketing communications and sales information. It's very interesting, but let's get on to the good stuff. <laughs> in, whose, in, in whose opinion <laughs> okay daily garbage for november and you see we uh, pretty flat through it the missing data there is the holiday and i do have two missing data points two days afterwards but we averaged around 140 bags per day uh, year over year was about 4200 bags so uh, consistent uh, from last year to this year for 2016-2017 December garbage, same thing, flat around 140 bags per day. Uh, year of year, also the same, uh, about you know, averaging 38, 3,900 bags per, per month. Uh, beach code enforcement, uh, this is our uh, year over year uh, contacts, uh, total contacts. You can see we're pretty low uh, compared to our uh, busier months. Uh, the uh, December contacts, same thing. A little bit of increase from uh, uh, 2016, but uh, once again, uh, low for uh, a monthly uh, total. The rest of these items are the uh, main items we uh, enforce on the beach. So it's glass, and once again, it's by month. Uh, so uh, glass, glass for December. Dogs, as you can see, you know, dogs are a big activity. Dogs for December. I won't belabor you with the details here. You have all this information contained in there and it's sent to you on a monthly basis. So if you've got any particular questions about any item, give me a call and we can discuss it. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is the bonfires. As you can see, our bonfires, which are a big activity uh, during the winter months, has a, 80, uh, a large or high 80% compliance rate. So uh, the people that are doing bonfires are doing a good job at it. Uh, you know, uh, years previous, that uh, compliance rate wasn't that high. Uh, so uh, everybody's learning, everybody's getting the message, and everybody is doing what we want them to do, and that's voluntary compliance. So moving on, uh, some more uh, beach code enforcement stuff, particular items, once again, it's all contained in there. Uh, beach code enforcement updates, as you know, we went through a uh, code revision process again uh, late last year. It followed the typical course of many meetings, lots of discussion. And in the end, a few items were changed, but, but not all the items that had been discussed. Big ones were there were some uh, miscellaneous, miscellaneous definition changes or additions to uh, offer clarity and remove ambiguity. 
We uh, changed some bonfire rules. So now the uh, bonfire rule says you have to have it cleaned up and off the beach by 1 a.m. Uh, previously, it was a 24-hour permit. We gave them till 8 a.m. in the morning. Uh, we feel like this will help out. This was also done in conjunction with vendors' uh, input. Uh, most of them uh, shut it down around 10 and then gives them ample opportunity to get it off the beach. The other items were we uh, established a code on grilling. Previously, we had no code on grilling on the beach. So now the uh, code says that you're allowed to have a gas-fired type grill and it has to be uh, 225 square inches or less. So that's about a 12 by 18 grill or a small uh, 16 inch diameter type grill. Uh, all readily available at big box stores and traditional type of tailgate. Grilling's not a big deal on the beach, to be honest with you. There's a lot of activity at Graydon Beach where people drive their cars. Uh, on the other areas of the beach, we don't see a whole lot of it, but we felt that it was important and South Walton Fire District felt it was important to establish uh, no charcoal on the beach. Charcoal tends to get dumped into the sand and becomes a big hazard. <clears throat> Uh, the other big one was uh, the tent size. We changed it to a 10 by 10 max, and we also put a restriction to the top third of the beach on public beaches. And so uh, that was a big change last year. We had a six by six. Uh, didn't quite work out like we thought it would. We received a lot of input uh, as to how people like their tents. And so uh, it was decided we would go back to a 10 by 10, and uh, but put this restriction on top third of the beach. Uh, on private property, you're allowed to use whatever size of tent you would like, wherever you would like. And uh, if you're a person exercising customary use, you're not allowed to use a tent at all. So we still expect some uh, uh, enforcement action on tents this year, but uh, hopefully this will relieve some of the uh, headaches we had last year. And then uh, there was a few sections in the uh, beach vending code that uh, were changed to uh, mirror some of these other ones in the general section. They were uh, fairly insignificant. So uh, we're moving forward, ready to enforce the code as it's written this year, and uh, expect to have about the same involvement we had last year. Capital Improvement Projects, uh, multi-use path, the section that is between Western Lake and 283 is still on hold pending easement from the state park system. As I previously reported to you, we uh, have to seek an easement for drainage and grading, and uh, Public Works Engineering Department is working on that. They actually did all the uh, uh, project management of this project. We uh, simply funded a portion of it, and that's our involvement. But uh, I've been uh, told by Public Works that they're working on it diligently and hope to get some headway soon. Uh, 283 to 83, we started uh, mid-January. And uh, if you haven't been down there, they've uh, got most of the path uh, pulled up <laughs> and are working on uh, uh, bringing in uh, appropriate dirt uh, for the base as well as stormwater structures. It's a four-month project. We expect them to be done about mid-May, and uh, we're keeping a close eye on them to make sure that uh, we resolve any issues that may come up and keep them on schedule. The uh, uh, next section whoop, uh, of path is, oh, also including that are some wooden bridges. We uh, had... Uh, uh, and our previous budgets approved replace all the wooden bridges on the bike path and we'll replace the ones in the sections that we're redoing at that time. Uh, so in this one we have Little Redfish, Alligator, and then the two approaches to the steel span at Big Redfish. Right. So uh, it'll look like the uh, wooden bridges we have at Western Lake. <clears throat> Are you widening that path at the same time as yes, reserving it from 8 yep. to 10? Yep, yep. All That's new right path will be 10 feet wide. Yep. Uh, appropriate signage on it. We haven't made a decision on a uh, middle line delineator, a white line, but uh, we're looking at that. We're seeing how it works without it. Uh, beach access renovations. This is the uh, facelift to all of our boardwalks at our regional beach access and neighborhood beach accesses. Those are slowly uh, coming through with design and permitting. We actually have four of them out for bid. That is uh, inlet. Uh, regional Beach Access, Fort Panic Regional Beach Access, uh, 395 Neighborhood Beach Access, and Hickory Neighborhood Beach Access. So as each one of these, you know, we got them funded through uh, FY16 and FY17 budgets. And as the, the, the permitting comes through, we'll uh, schedule these for construction. Of course, we'll do it off season. When these bids come in, uh, we'll see how they uh, stack up to the budget and more than likely, uh, depending on the time frame, it takes about 
45 days to do a neighborhood beach access, uh, a little bit longer to do a regional beach access. So uh, if it looks like we can't get them done before June, we'll probably postpone the construction until after the season. Uh, our four, or I'm sorry, our three uh, land purchases we made recently uh, is the Dune Allen Regional Beach Access, that is across from Stinky's Restaurant, our Miramar Beach Regional Beach Access, which is across from Amalfi Coast, and our Seagrove Regional uh, Seagrove Beach Regional Beach Access, which is across from the Tom Thumb and Seagrove. The uh, Dune Allen is about 60% complete with design and permit. We did recently receive notice from the planning department that they will not be able to uh, grant a variance. We had asked for a variance to the front setback line in order to set the bathhouse uh, on the edge of the right-of-way. The purpose was is we're trying to establish connectivity to the bike path, the multi-use path. However, uh, Scenic Quarter 30A uh, has uh, uh, a uh, buffer required buffer zone and uh, they uh, informed us that they would could not support a, uh, a variance request for that so we've uh, asked the uh, engineer to uh, move that back 20 feet we're going to lose two parking spaces uh, but we'll gain a little bit more extra golf cart parking out uh, in the front and we can probably put some storm water out there land development code allows for I think 40 percent of that to be used for storm water so we're looking at all the different options to make it look good and, uh, and try to keep as much park as we can. Uh, I don't think it's going to set us back too much. Uh, we're looking to have this uh, designed and permitted somewhere around June. And uh, since it doesn't affect anything because it's an unused piece of property right now, we'll go ahead and start construction after the procurement process. Uh, Miramar Beach, Regional Beach Access, we've had our uh, meeting that the BCC asked us to have with the residents of uh, Moffey Coast. It was a good meeting. They offered some input. We have uh, adjusted the conceptual designs and we have a public workshop scheduled for the 15th in this room at 5 p.m. Uh, February 15th to take in general public input and then we'll adjust the conceptual designs uh, as it fits and we'll take it to the BCC for approval to uh, start uh, the actual design development of that. Seagrove Beach Regional Beach Access, the engineer was recently awarded the contract for design and permitting. They've done their surveying and are putting together an assessment of the uh, property and uh, we'll be meeting with them here shortly to uh, go over that assessment and start getting some ideas. Once again, we'll produce uh, a couple or three conceptual designs, bring that before you and the BCC, uh, take input if we need more public workshops and then uh, start with design development of that. So uh, most of the time these take about 12 months for design and permitting, barring any big issues. Uh, so uh, the funding will uh, come in the future budgets and possibly from reserve budgets. 30 day parking project, we're about to wrap that up. As you can see down at Fort Panic, they're putting in the uh, last of the uh, landscaping. There's a little bit of cleanup to do at uh, all the locations. Uh, but uh, here in another month or so, that should all be wrapped up and uh, that uh, large capital improvement project seems to be a success. So uh, we're looking at some more areas, uh, identifying more areas where we might can do some parallel parking. Uh, we did receive a, a approval from the BCC to uh, do a conceptual design of, uh, to connect the new uh, Dune Island Regional Beach Access to Fort Panic uh, with that same parallel parking and sidewalk. And so we'll be developing that here in the next couple of months. Um, our beach operations maintenance facility, as I alluded earlier, we uh, have taken on some uh, uh, you know, public uh, uh, business in that building. So uh, we also have a little more staff. Our previous attempt at bidding, the, uh, pr the uh, uh, proposals came in more than we had budgeted. The BCC asked us to go back and look at it. We did, we cut some items out of the project and we have it now out for rebid. We hope to get better pricing and move on with that project. Any questions about what we do in Beach Brian, Operations? On, on that um, <clears throat> redesign of the office. Um, yes, sir. If you're going to be moving in four or five years, you, is that a really just a minimal thing to? Yeah, it is. What we're doing is uh, basically wood, wood framing, uh, interior built out of one of our bays. So we have uh, five bays over there. One's already built out. Wood framing, it'll be a, a second floor that houses uh, two offices for code enforcement and then a large area that'll be uh, 
have some cubicles in it and some conference space. Mm -hmm. The lower area will be our new crew break area. Right now, our front room where we receive public is also our crew break area. <laughs> uh, and then it's very light remodeling the existing. So, uh, I'm just you know, asking uh, in anticipation of what we talked about earlier about relocating. We don't right. want to spend a whole lot of money on something we're going to yeah. abandon in five yeah. years. You know, uh, if it wasn't quite the necessity for receiving the public, might could hold off on it, make do what we got. but. Uh, you know, I think it's important that since we now invite the public into our space that we have appropriate accommodations for them. I agree. Yeah. Yes, sir. You mentioned something about a white line on, this, on that path. Correct. What for? Well, uh, modern, modern, <laughs> modern, modern, modern design of if bike paths. If they don't paths, know how to stay on one side or the other, I mean, they yeah. drive a car and they ride a bike. I mean, it's just kind of natural that you go right side. Right. So uh, I mean, it just it would just. That's why we're that's why we're holding off on it. Is is yeah. you know typical modern uh, multi-use path design has has a white delineator, and, I mean, and because when you have that, it it ought to, it does. You think most people would say, "I'm going to stay on the right side," but as you ride down the path, you get lost in the beautiful scenery, and all of a sudden, you know, there's nobody else around you, and it's your path. Well, you know, they'll you're, find the scenery and they'll yeah. find a path. So, right. You know. But if there's a white line, you automatically triggers your mind to say, "Hey, my recommendation to is to leave the white line yeah. out." They, they, if we'll they definitely can't figure take, out how to go down a path, and they don't need to be yeah. on the path. We'll, we'll definitely take public input, and like I say, we're, we're trying to establish more of this ten-foot wide path before we make any permanent adjustments to it, so we can, you know, get a better idea of how people like it, how they use it. I hope some more appropriate trail etiquette signage uh, helps, and uh, we'll get our communications department to do some PSAs on how to use the path. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Brian, I, I kind of agree with Tim because the, the bike path looks so natural. Yeah, I agree. It, and it covers mm -hmm. some beautiful scenery that, you know, you, you just can't see anywhere else in the world. Yeah. And and I would hate to put this man-made white line down yeah, the I middle agree. of it. Hey, um, our fir our first, I, I our first Tim, input. The, the, it's called <laughs> Tim Pucci Trail. So, I mean, yeah, That's right. let's, just, let's leave it a trail. <laughs> <like> <laughs> Was that named after you with yeah, your last Tim name? Pucci <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Brian, um, this may be an obvious question. Maybe everybody here knows it already. Do we have a recycling program? The county. Uh, the, 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 I see all these tons and tons of garbage we, reports. No, we, we, we do not. Well, the county has recycling trailers that they put out at various locations that yeah. people can then recycle their, you know, their items. Um, we, as beach operations, take in mostly wet garbage off the beach, and it goes into the waste management uh, containers that then go to the transfer station. Uh, if, if garbage is mixed, it can't be recycled. Uh, the items that we do take off the beach as leave no trace uh, go up to uh, the public works facility where it is filtered out, uh, and then uh, it's my understanding that fabric is separated from metal, and depending on commodity prices, if it's cost feasible, right. it does get recycled. S some of it gets recycled in the form of the county yard sale, the annual yard sale. Okay. Uh, so, to answer your question. You mean the, the, Pardon me? The metal gets sold. Correct. In other words, they, they, they separate solid. metal from fabric. Uh, we do reserve one container in our uh, uh, District 5 yard mm -hmm. that we put nothing but uh, what we call trash beach equipment. So yeah. it's stuff that's not leave no trace. It's what people have torn up and have drug up next to our uh, garbage collection stations. Right. And uh, it gets treated the same way. So, so we don't really have a program where we have, you know, segregated, you know, bins that um, encourage, no, so you know, We recycling. do have some, uh, what we call the, um, I can't remember the name of it, but they are uh, solar powered trash compactors that do offer some recycling ability at the regional beach accesses. Okay. Now, they are problematic, they're old. Uh, to be quite honest with you, some of them don't function like they're supposed to, and I'd like to get rid of them. Okay. And if we do, uh, I'll discuss with Jay about putting in a, uh, a uh, separated container type uh, mm -hmm. uh, set where people have the opportunity to put glass, yeah. plastic, and, and then wet. Garbage. Yeah, and I, I realize based on economic factors, there are good and bad reasons. It's not always the right time to be recycling. Uh, the reason mm -hmm. I kind of bring it up is that Marriott the hotels we're affiliated with next year they're instituting a mandatory recycling so we have to we're in the process of finding a way to make it at least cost neutral at best you know mm -hmm. 
So I didn't know whether there was already somebody out there who knew a lot more about this. Yeah. There are some private companies that are doing recycling. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how they're making their money. I think it's actually off the service. I don't believe that the commodity prices yeah. and where you have to take the commodities to be recycled uh, make, it, make it worthwhile. But, okay. you know, recycling shouldn't just be about money. It should be about, sure. you know, about doing what's right Absolutely. for the environment. Okay. Any more? Thank you, Brian. Thank is that you. something we would want to do in the future is make our collection areas on the beaches multi-container? Mm -hmm. we, we, we could look at that. I would recommend doing it at regional beach accesses, uh, you know, uh, at top and bottom. Uh, so uh, I'll bring that before our next Destination Improvement Committee. Uh, Please that, do. That's, that's a good... Uh, avenue to start with we, we brought it up a couple of times over mm -hmm. the years it's just been up i guess because there's no you know we're all unincorporated down here i don't know if it's feasibly reasonable or not i, I it's been brought up a lot of our okay. guests will also ask sure mm -hmm. you know, people expect yeah. yeah very much so yeah you know, yeah maybe it's uh, stay, something light stay all those mm -hmm. certificates and awards yeah. trip advisor that's yeah, yeah. That's Maybe it's a, a project to start at the uh, top of the boardwalk, uh, you know, with the appropriate uh, looking uh, containers. You probably seen this different state parks. They do a pretty good job, but they'll have plastic, glass, and then just trash. And uh, you know, it wouldn't be that much of effort for our guys to collect it separately and make sure it gets into the uh, proper recycling stream. Which is? Which is, uh, well, <laughs> until again, we have Until the county addresses recycling, mm -hmm. it does no good for you to collect it, me to collect it, and you to collect right. it if there's no place. Right. Yeah. We, we, and we, putting we, it in the landfill and having it separated out of the landfill is not recycling. Mm -hmm. No, we would, you know, it'd go, well, I mean, proper stream, it would go wherever the blue trailers go for separation and then off to its final destination to a regional recycling center. Yeah. Both, both counties on either side of us do a recycling program, and that's one thing I think we fall short of. They do curbside recycling? They, yeah, my, yes. 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 Yeah. Like I said, there's a couple of companies that have picked up on that here recently. Uh, my family uses a company, and it, it, it's, it's fairly easy. It all goes in one uh, large garbage can. They pick it up once a week. All right. Thank you, Brian. All right, thank yeah, you. That needs to be addressed. Mr. Tusa. All right, I will try to be brief since we are after the noon hour. <laughs> uh, just a couple of updates uh, for me. Uh, one, Driftwood Road property. Uh, this is a piece of property that is about, I guess, 300 feet north of our Miramar Beach access, our existing Miramar Beach access. Um, the owner of that property approached me uh, some time ago uh, and asked if we'd be interested in buying this property. And I said, well, I said, you know, I think it's a good spot for parking and I'll certainly bring it forward to the Board of County Commissioners, which I did, I guess, about maybe two meetings ago. And uh, so the board authorized uh, appraisals on the property and uh, land use report on the property. So that is happening now and uh, be bringing that back to the board once um, those appraisals and land use report gets completed. So probably uh, it's not going to be for the next meeting. I'm hoping it'll be for the following BCC meeting. So. Uh, they're asking just a little over $2.1 million for the property, um, which, you know, I don't know if it's high or not. I won't know that until, honestly, uh, we get the appraisals back. So, uh, but again, it's a great site, not far from the beach. It's a little, little north of uh, Scenic Gulf Drive, but still a very short walk. How big so, is it? Um, I don't remember the exact size, but um, if I remember correctly, we could put... It's like 80 to 100 cars on it so it's we, we could really expand our parking presence over there and honestly I think if we were to acquire the property we could probably check the box on parking over at that beach access because um, I think we have more than adequate parking based on the number of people we want to get to the beach so um, legislative update uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of an update what's going on uh, with the legislature there's lots of things going on that impact uh, TDC's um, and I put in your packet a quite lengthy report, actually I think it was a separate packet, quite lengthy report that um, our um, lobbyist Kelly Horton put together for us. Um, and so just real quick, go through these. Uh, economic and development, tourism, program accountability. Um, that, that's a big one pertaining to us. 
and it requires more transparency um, and activity um, related to TDCs. And I'll go through a few things here. I have a little laundry list. Uh, board members must report conflict of interest. Uh, limits a TDC director salary to that, uh, that it cannot exceed the county manager or CEO. Uh, no bonuses or severance packages unless specified um, or authorized by law. Uh, contracts of $250,000 or greater must be reviewed by the county, Board of County Commissioners, which we already do that here. So some of these things really, it's a transparency thing, but we're so transparent here. Um, per diem rates will be defined, hotel rates will be defined, uh, no TDT funds to be used for food uh, outside of per diem hotel rates for employees or board members. That might be problematic when we have our annual meeting. Uh, that means none of our team members would be able to eat at an event like that. So we'll have to kind of figure that out if this kind of moves forward. Um, the Auditor General will select two counties uh, to audit uh, per year that receive less than $30 million. So obviously that's the category we fall within. So um, those are just a few things, a few highlights of that. Um, another item, uh, expansion of TDT funds. Uh, so this bill would expand the use of TDT funds to include land acquisition, improvement, maintenance, and construction of public facilities. Uh, public facilities are designed as transportation, sewer, solid waste facility, drainage, water, pedestrian facilities. So we're already doing some of these things through legislative finding. So um, I don't know how much that would impact us. Um, it is. I think we should note here that it's important that um, not all these projects can be funded strictly with TDT funds. So uh, I think right now, Clay, is it 70 percent um, is yeah, what's being stipulated? Yeah, I believe 585 has a limitation that says no more than 70 percent of a project would be able to be funded by TDT funds, and the local government would have to have a two-thirds vote to approve the expenditure and then specifically identify the other 30 percent of the funding source. Um, additionally, I believe that the current, and I believe it's in the Senate bill as well, has a provision that the TDC would have to pay to have a private study done, effectively an audit of each of these expenditures to show the relationship to tourism and the expenditure breakdowns and how it correlates. So while it certainly opens up the funding bucket, um, it's going to put some additional restrictions on how that can be used and probably some additional costs. And Mr. Toos and I have been talking about that and looking at how this is in Anticipated, if it is to pass, will be handled in other counties. Maybe this is right now only in counties under 100,000, although that could change. Thank you. Um, another item is vacation rentals. Um, the state is looking at putting a regulatory system in place on vacation rentals, and that would uh, preempt local regulations. So we have to follow that closely. Because I think that is something, obviously, that we want to regulate and not have Tallahassee Absolutely. regulating. So we'll be monitoring that as we move forward through the session. Um, trade what? secrets. Uh, you know, this bill repeals trade secret provisions for agencies under public records and establishes a new public records exemption for trade secrets. So, um, you know, we, I don't really think we have to worry about that too much on our end. There are some DMOs, TDCs, uh, you know, they have a lot more dollars coming through their systems than we do. And they use that. And, and I have to say, I've worked for large DMOs. I mean, when I worked for the New Orleans CVB, trade secrets is legitimate. I mean, how you do business and how you conduct yourself against your competition, um, there should be something there. That doesn't really apply to us in the destination that we are. But, you know, I think some of our um, folks in Central and South Florida, you know, it is a concern of theirs, something that they need to really look at and, and how the state's going to address that related to them. Um, Constitution Revision uh, Commission, um, that has commenced, that's every 20 years that happens. Um, and so I think one thing in particular that we need to look at is Amendment 95 that was uh, proffered by Tom Lee, Senator Tom Lee. And um, this um, amendment would really preempt local government from how they uh, regulate their um, communities. Um, and this could be not only from an ordinance standpoint, but also from a legislative uh, finding standpoint. So this is something that we have to pay close attention to because it could be really impactful um, on how this relates to us and everything that we've done from ordinances to legislative findings. So we'll be following this closely uh, as that moves through, uh, you know, over the next few months. Any questions for me? I kind of lost track of the impact. Um, it was at the House of Tallahassee, the, the um, time zone, considering putting all of Florida in the eastern time zone. 
Yes. And then getting rid of daylight savings time. I kind of missed it the last couple of days. Well, so there, there's, there's two things. Uh, one is putting the whole state on Eastern time zone, which from what I read, there's some significant opposition to that. Just for school-age children waiting for school buses early in the morning, they're going to be out there in the dark. Um, so I'd be surprised if that moves forward. And the other one was to shift the whole state uh, and keep the state on daylight savings time. So we wouldn't be off of it, we'd be on it. Um, so, you know, I, I think that actually would kind of be good for us. Uh, that we would just stay on in, in the winter time during our shoulder season. It would give us more daylight, and we could, you know, have people recreating later into the day. Yeah, and this 4:30. Yeah. 4:30 <laughs> dark. Is yeah. Some, after 34 years, I'm still not used to it. Yeah. <laughs> ready for bed at eight o'clock. <laughs> Shoot, I get off of work and I'm ready for bed. I I, I love spring and summer. <laughs> there you go. So anyway, so if, if there's no other questions for me, that's all I have. Jay, I want to say thanks. Um, this is, this is my first meeting as chair, and I've spent a little bit of time with you. Certainly, I've gotten to know you very well over the, the last couple of years, and I want to commend you on the job that you're doing and um, look forward to continue working with well, you. I appreciate that. So. And I can't do it without my team. I mean, I have, we have a great team at the TDC, and we have 65 employees, and they are out there every single day promoting our destination in some form or fashion. So they, they need to be commended. Well, from me to you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and well said. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll make a motion um, to keep you as chair, too. Like <laughs> <laughs> it's your first day on the job, so we understand. All right, see, now I said that, but now I'm allowed to, uh, the council yes. to make comments, so have at it. <laughs> <laughs> a motion we adjourn. Um, Second. Second. There, call I, for public comment. Oh, public, oh public. got a call for public comment. That's, yeah. I just did that, and then he yeah. screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is there any council comments? I'm his mentor. All right. Are there any public comments? All right. Go ahead. Yeah. I have motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Passed. Chair, sure, well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Uh, Good job. That was fun. You didn't do so bad. Uh, you do. Uh, oh, that's probably it. Yeah. I, I yeah. think it should be actually your turn when it's over. Yeah, me too. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, gentlemen. I'm going to take that. Thank you. 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 Thank